Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. My name is Ayun Minchev. I'm head of Europe primary markets um, at the London Stock Exchange. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you um, at the inaugural Moldovan Capital Markets Day at London Stock Exchange this morning. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova, Natalia Gavrilitsa, who will deliver her keynote speech. Thank you. Good morning, it's great to be here. Uh, I think today is a very important day for Moldova, and I'm honored here uh, to present my country and the commitments that my government has undertaken exactly 100 days ago. In July, we won a landslide victory in the parliamentary elections on a strong mandate for anti-corruption, good governance, and economic development. For the first time uh, since Moldova's independence, actually, the parliament, the presidency, and the government are all aligned and steering the country in the direction of European integration and in the direction of an economic development based on good governance principles. Our reform agenda is ambitious, bold, and urgent. We have the full support of our people, as well as of our international partners. Under the association agreement with the European Union and the deep and comprehensive free trade area agreement, we, we, we already have important engagements and we are fully committed to adopt and implement all the necessary provisions to make our country more EU-like. Some of the main priorities of my government's reform agenda includes the justice sector reform, which involves an external vetting of judges and prosecutors. It is crucial both to our citizens and for the business community and our foreign visitors and foreign investors to have trust in institutions to have stability and predictability. The justice reform will go way beyond the justice system. This will be a societal reform, but also an economic reform. A fair, independent, and accountable justice system is not only fundamental to the functioning of democracy, it is the prerequisite of a functioning market economy. We need to do much more to tackle corruption, and we have already started doing it. From the very first day in power, my government has adopted a zero tolerance to corruption policy. We are working hard to create a more open, transparent, and fair government administration and to ensure good governance in all areas. We have already proven this through uh, stopping uh, acquisitions that were done with uh, violations and uh, through investigations that we have already passed to the prosecutor's general office. Another area, important area for our development is digitization of our public services and of our economy. The COVID-19 pandemic has given the necessary boost and it made policymakers realize the importance of accelerating the process of the digital transformation of our country. Digitizing our public administration and helping digitize our economy will help us create an integrated ecosystem where businesses can interact between themselves and the state institution while reducing wasted time, bureaucracy, and saving financial resources. For the first time ever, I have nominated a deputy prime minister responsible exclusively for digitalization. We believe that we must act fast, advance, and waste no time. The parliament has already voted in second and final reading uh, on Thursday, a package of several laws on digitization following the government's proposal. This means among others that entrepreneurs will now be able to register their businesses online without physical presence, only by using a qualified electronic signature. We also ensured that the EU e-signatures will be recognized in Moldova which will allow ease of interaction with state authorities online, the creation of a one single shop for certain services delivered to citizen businesses in their interaction with public authorities and canceling the burdensome need of asking for different paper-based documents which hinder business development. 
And we have only started. We literally have been in office for just 100 days. We want to transform Moldova in a truly attractive country where digital solutions are the norm rather than the exception. I also want to affirm uh, that my government is pro-business. We encourage investments, and I want to see more and more investors coming to the country. I want to open a channel of communication between the capital markets and the businesses for the Republic of Moldova. My government will do everything it can to improve the credibility and the image of the Republic of Moldova internationally through concrete actions. And our goal is also to improve the country's credit rating uh, by improving indicators of good governance. I strongly believe it that we can do it and we can do it fast. We are working to create the premises for private equity funds and investment funds to be able to participate more safely in the acquisition of Moldovan companies through all the financial instruments available on the market. We are also analyzing the possibility of issuing government euro bonds to finance projects of national importance. We support the initiative of Moldovan businesses to go global by launching them on international capital markets through initial public off offerings and or euro bonds. We know that Moldova Agrarian Bank is exploring the opportunities to enter the international markets, and if they decide to do so, we will support them in this mission. There is truly potential. Who would have thought several years ago that a company from Moldova, uh, who is listed uh, that that is listed on another reputable market, would reach a capitalization rate of over eight billion dollars? So uh, there is definitely potential, and the government will do everything uh, to support the businesses, to support the business environment, to create um, a good governance context where companies and businesses and investors can thrive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. And now I'd like to invite Julia Hoggett, the CEO of London Stock Exchange. Ladies and gentlemen, Prime Minister, distinguished guests. Good morning to all of you here present and everybody watching online as well. It's my utter pleasure to welcome you to the first Moldovan Capital Markets Day event, organized together with Maib, and Renaissance Capital. I'd first like to thank uh, the Prime Minister for her remarks and commitment to this really important agenda. We're honoured that this inaugural Moldovan event is taking place here at the London Stock Exchange, and I personally hope it's one of many that we can host over the years. I'd like to start my remarks by congratulating Moldova on its really important achievements to date. It's inspiring to see a country's consistent economic growth over the recent years, and after the pandemic, Moldova's economy appears to be poised for recovery, and this is exactly the resiliency that international investors hope to see. Over the course of the day, we'll hear from some of the leading companies based in the region, from investors putting their capital behind Moldova's promising growth stories, and market experts with a long-standing commitment to supporting companies on their journey to the international capital markets. Today's speakers will talk about recent economic trends that are shaping the investment landscape in Moldova, and new areas of growth opportunity. I'm proud that the London Stock Exchange keeps strengthening its hard-earned position as the international platform of choice for state and private businesses from emerging Europe to raise finance. 120 companies worth 900, over $940 billion from this region have listed equity on our markets. Over the last 12 months, we've welcomed companies like Fixed Price, Caspi, Ignisys Group, Baltic Classified, Eurowag, and Softline to our markets. And nearly 500 sovereign and corporate bonds with proceeds totaling over 200 billion to date have been issued out of the region in London. We're pleased to see that our long-standing relationship with this region continues to grow and evolve. And there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, London offers an unparalleled infrastructure for investors with investors, advisors, and market intermediaries that know and understand emerging markets and the compelling growth stories that are available here. I, for myself, started my career in this very market, so it's a matter of pride for me that I get to uh, present at this event today. 
This expertise is what helps London maintain its position as Europe's largest capital market, providing access to the deepest and most liquid pool of capital in the region. This year alone, nearly $60 billion has been raised through IPOs and following offerings on the London Stock Exchange, and we've just hosted our 101st IPO of the year. Secondly, our agile, customer-oriented and innovative approach creates a productive environment for companies to grow in our markets and for investors to channel their capital into the right growth opportunities. Last but not least, London Stock Exchange has an important role to play in linking and enabling global capital flows. It's not a coincidence that over 25% of all global cross-border capital is raised by the London Stock Exchange, and 40% of our issuers come from outside the UK. So to conclude, I'd like to commend all of the efforts and progress achieved so far by Moldova's government and private sector to fuel the country's reforms and economic growth. And we're so pleased to see that this event has attracted enthusiastic in-person and online attendance from aspiring Moldovan issuers, international and regional investors, advisors, and other capital markets enablers. We fully share this enthusiasm and look forward to helping Moldovan companies realize their strategic ambitions. This event is here to serve as a platform for sharing the country's recent successes, exchanging perspectives, and helping shape exciting new opportunities across Moldova sectors. And I can I hope that you all have a very, very productive day in service of that objective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julia. I'd like to present uh, next uh, an online uh, address from Odile Renaud Basov, the president of EBRD. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm very grateful for the chance to spread the word about the very positive news from Moldova. It is a country that we in the EBRD know very well. We have been alongside our Moldovan partners and friends in good times but also in less good times. And today, the outlook for Moldova looks more hopeful than for many years. Its people send a strong message to the world in the election this summer. All branches of government are now under the leadership of a party which is firmly supportive of reforms. And there will be challenges ahead, I'm sure. But the Moldovan economy is recovering very robustly from the shock inflicted in, by the pandemic. Our latest forecast predicts GDP growth of 7% this year. I mentioned the less good times for Moldova just now. The EBRD played a major role in turning the banking sector around. The 2014 banking crisis set in motion a whole series of structural challenges. And there is now a new focus on transparency and corporate governance and an emphasis on attracting the right kind of investors. Basel III adaptation is ahead of most of its CIS peers. Banks are well capitalized and, are, and have low levels of NPL. It's no surprise then that one of Moldova's leading bank is looking to list on an international stock exchange. That Moldovan bank is Moldova Agroid Bank, and we are delighted to be part, alongside Ivalda and Horizon Capital, of the consortium and to be one of the bank's biggest shareholders. Mahib, as we call it for short, is strongly committed to the highest standards of corporate governance and has a well-qualified, diverse supervisory board. We welcome its commitment to environmental, social, and corporate governance values, as well as its focus on expanding its green portfolio. I believe that more good times for Moldova lie ahead. The health of its banking sector and the banks within it only makes me more hopeful for its future. Thank you very much. And now I'm delighted to present the first male speaker of the day, <laughs> Octavian Armasto, Governor of the National Bank of Moldova. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Uh, 
Indeed, had a lot has been said about what was achieved, especially previous speaker mentioned uh, the banking sector reforms. I'll try not to repeat uh, myself with this, but indeed, the banking sector is Moldova is uh, 30 years of age. This year, National Bank of Moldova uh, marked its 30th anniversary. It's been a history with a lot of uh, difficult moments, a lot of achievements, a lot of hard lessons to learn. Uh, lately, we have implemented, implemented a very important reform agenda, starting especially with the year 2016, with the implementation of an uh, IMF program focused on uh, uh, reforms in the banking sector, uh, just following the bank crisis in 2014. I would say that uh, these uh, reforms brought good results, tangible results, and um, visible improvements to the banking sector in Moldova. As a result of this effort, we have new investors in the banking sector. 90% of the banking assets are controlled by European investors now. Banks are well capitalized, well governed. We have implemented the uh, Basel III standards. We have uh, improved the governance in the bank, but also the governance in the central bank. So uh, banks on the top of all are well supervised. Um, bank proved to be resilient, especially during the last uh, pandemic crisis. In fact, they, were, they uh, provided uh, the necessary support to the economy to stay afloat and to uh, swiftly recover after the, after the crisis. I'm sure there will be more challenges ahead, but uh, as I mentioned, we have a lot of buffers uh, in the banking sector, in the fiscal sector. Central bank has uh, significant uh, uh, reserves to withstand any possible shocks. And uh, this indeed is the result of uh, of effort made by authorities uh, along the time. I would mention that there is a, a partnership trade and a cooperation agreement between Moldova and UK, which create a basis for cooperation between markets, markets, invest, investors, authorities, and supervisors, which basically create a good framework for future cooperation. Uh, and we are very much looking forward for investors to come, including the banking sector. The economy, uh, we estimate economy's growth potential at around 4%. We see that the bank loans to GDP, uh, GDP ratio is rather low compared to, uh, to other countries in the region. It's slightly above 20%, which shows a great potential for growth in the future. So I think these are opportunities that can be explored. Uh, our job as uh, uh, supervisor a central bank will be to make sure that uh, we have stability in the market, that the uh, banks are strong and doing their job well. And looking forward, National Bank of Moldova is committed to advance the development of the financial and banking sector in the country. And we are looking forward for new investors to come to our industry. Thank you very much. So now we're moving on uh, to our first panel session. I'd like to invite um, uh, Charles Robertson, Global Chief Economist, um, a handle, Head of Macro Strategy Unit at Renaissance Capital to take, um, to take the seat here. And uh, also the panelists, please. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got Bayan here. We have the IMF, World Bank, and one more person from the EBRD all online, which is gonna be a little complicated, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, but we will be coming to Bayan a lot because you're here and I really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to start with a, a few slides. I've been covering uh, Eastern Europe and emerging markets for a very long time. Um, I was actually in uh, Eastern Europe for the first time 30 years ago. Um, so when Moldova, uh, became independent. Um, I was demonstrating on the streets of Kiev against the coup, um, which was quite fun. 
in August 1991. At least when you're 20 years old, you think it's quite fun. Um, now I'd be terrified in staying in my hotel. Um, what, what we've seen over 30 years is a lot of countries with a shortage of savings, but an extremely well-educated population able to make incredible gains on growth um, over time. And what we've been looking at is some of the success stories um, over the last 30 years. When, what I try and do for investors is to get them to look at countries with extremely low debt levels, whether it's private sector debt or government debt, and say this is a fantastic opportunity. We need to frame uh, Moldova within the context of other countries. And one of the key things you get struck by is the population shock of a decline in numbers over the last 25 years. Um, actually, Moldova, not that different from, say, Estonia in terms of the fall. And this gives you a sense of what the country could be. And we're thinking Moldova has the potential to be very similar to the success stories we've seen in the Baltics. There's been an incredible growth in per capita GDP over the last 25 years. Um, in Georgia, it's gone up roughly tenfold. In Moldova, a very similar number. But I can't help but look at what Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia have achieved to say, this is what we could yet see over the next 10, 20 years if we get capital into the country. And assuming that integration with the EU continues um, over the coming years. One of the things I find most exciting is also low wage economies. Um, and that sounds like an evil capitalist thing to say, but we've got Moldova down here at $165 at minimum wage. Um, we're looking at next door Romania um, sitting at more like uh, $540 minimum wage. So Moldova's got the educated human capital. It's just really cheap and competitive. Um, and I think the, the scope for growth here, and then the scope for, for lending, uh, because as people, as their wages increase, they will be able to borrow a lot more. This is going to support that bank lending growth that the central bank governor talked about. Uh, on the currency side, sorry, very messy charts. Um, I do always look at currencies, particularly when I see current account deficits, like Moldova's got. Uh, fairly common in a whole host of countries. We've seen similar numbers out of Georgia on the current account deficit side. It's done very well. We actually think the currency is going to stay very stable, around 17 to a dollar over the next couple of years. Um, so, yeah, we've got a really bullish forecast, actually. We're looking for 10% growth in 2021. I've got a report here, happy to distribute uh, to anyone who's interested. Um, we, we do think we're going to, the 4% sustainable growth story the central bank governor spoke about, I think, is probably a good reference point. But this year, we've got the benefit of a big harvest. We like that minimum wage. We suspect the currency is going to be stable in coming years. Um, most important to me is that most of the time I see reform governments come to power in a country, it's after a disaster. Somebody comes and messes up an economy, really puts it into a terrible place, and then the reformists come. They do the hard work trying to make it better for three or four years, and then they get defeated at the next election because they've done the hard work. Doesn't look like that in Moldova. It looks like this is a reformist government that's actually inherited good numbers, uh, sustainable debt levels that you could imagine two terms, maybe three terms of this government or this president being in power and then sustaining a reform path. And it's exactly what Moldova needs. Yes, it's per capita GDP is up ninefold, but it could double and double again in coming decades. So uh, I'm going to stop presenting there, uh, IT guys. And I'd like to talk to our panel now about, I'm going to sit down, um, about what they've experienced and what they, they see. Um, if I could first, if this is going to work, get the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, we have here uh, Rogers, we can all see Rogers from the IMF. 
Vladimir, sorry, sorry, come up. Yes, I knew that. I felt somebody was missing. Central Bank. I'm coming to you a lot, so thank you. That would have been awkward. Um, we've got Rogers, we've got Angela from the EBRD, she's the country head, uh, and we've got Nguna from the World Bank. Um, if I could let everyone introduce themselves, because it's much better than, than me trying to do a bad job on this. Um, and if I could start with you, Vladimir. Thank you, Charlie. I'm really delighted to be here today, and uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to present to you the side of uh, Moldova that probably was somewhere in the shadows. Uh, and to present to you probably the uh, potential of the country that hasn't been seen uh, through the uh, reminiscences of the previous uh, troubles of, of the country. Uh, I'm the first deputy governor of the Central Bank of Moldova. Uh, I've been uh, with the bank since late uh, 2016. And before that, uh, I traveled around the world, uh, spent some time with the IMF World Bank. Very helpful experience. Very helpful. Um, I will come back to you in, in a moment. Bayan, as you're here, can I um, ask you to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm associate banker in uh, the EBRD's private equity team. So I've done investments probably most of the EBRD's countries of operations. But the last four years, I've been working in Moldova, specifically on investment in the largest bank in the country, Mai. Um, the most uh, exciting and interesting job when you do investments is actually see the companies grow, the companies and uh, the people as well, how they change, how they react to challenges, and how they grow, uh, you know, professionally as well. And it's a great honor to be part of this story to present Moldova and uh, what it can deliver to the rest of the investors. Brilliant. And um, if I could go to the IMF, because we will be coming to you uh, first, Rogers, um, if you could just introduce yourself a little and say your, something of your background and experience. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, once again, I want to thank you for this opportunity to join the panel. Uh, my name is Rogers Chawani. I am the resident representative for the IMF. My previous work has been in the region, of course, as well as uh, the African region. I also have a central banking background before I joined the IMF, and it's good to be here to tell the Moldovan story. Thank you. And Nguna, from the World Bank, you're the second port of call, no offense, but IMF to me always comes first. World Bank, very important though. Um, what can you tell me about your background? Uh, thank you, Carl. It's absolutely fine to have IMF coming first. That's, that's the way it should be, right? <laughs> um, but yes, I'm, I'm in the Moldova. I'm country manager for uh, Moldova of the World Bank. Um, I'm a newcomer, I believe so. I've been here since the beginning of September, therefore I'm still um, trying to understand and learn, um, which I hope will happen quickly. Um, before that, I was, uh, I've been working in, in the Africa region and in, in the Asia. I came here directly from Cambodia, where I was doing the similar type of work uh, in the East, East Asia and Pacific. Uh, very happy to be here. Fantastic. I've got this feeling that Cambodia, with its next door neighbor, Thailand, Thailand, uh, a richer, more successful uh, economy at the moment, but Cambodia is doing very well as a lower cost manufacturing base next to, to Thailand. So I, I quite like that comparison for Moldova next to the EU as well. Um, and Angela, last but not least, um, head of the EBRD uh, in, in in Moldova. Um, how, how long have you been there? Uh, I've been here nearly four years. Um, and um, yeah, I'm basically the head of our operations in Moldova, covering all the sectors. And previously, I was in Armenia. Uh, previous to that, I was uh, also working with the IMF in Armenia, with the Central Bank in Armenia, and some development organizations such as the USAID and the USAED. Um, I've been with EBRD for about 15, 16 years now and uh, covered a lot of different sector projects, complex projects in the public sectors, private sector, cross-border, all corporations, focusing primarily on the Caucasus, sometimes on Central Asia as well. Uh, and of course, Moldova was always part of the sector, not, not the sector of the group of the business that we were covering. So fairly um, 
knowledgeable about the Moldova market before I came here. I had some surprises, but I had some pleasant surprises as well as uh, some surprises. But we'll talk about that. We'll come to those in a second. I might just move so that um, I can give center center screen actually to um, to Rogers because Rogers, I'd quite like you to the first port of call for investors, for the debt investors and equity investors is always going to be the IMF. What's the state of play? Are we going to get a deal? What have you been negotiating? Um, and how does the IMF see, see the, the, the outlook? And it's fine if you don't agree with our 10% growth forecast. I'm, I'm chilled with that. <laughs> thank you so much, Charlie. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, I wish to provide an update of where we are in terms of the um, IMF program. Um, after we reached the staff level agreement on October 21, in exactly 35 days from today, our executive board is going to consider Moldova's request uh, for a new program. If I could move to the next slide, please. Uh, we're not seeing slides. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if I tease. Oh, we are. No, slides are good. Yeah, they, they, yeah they've been shared from there, yeah, sure. So what I want to do is very quickly go through the information um, that um, provided the context with which we have the discussions. I'll highlight quickly the reforms that we have been targeting, and then I'll close with a quick update of the macroeconomic uh, situation. If you may move to the next slide, please. So as you all are aware, our discussions were held in a very challenging context. Um, we have a pandemic, which has invariably, of course, affected the Moldovan economy. Um, it was also happening against the backdrop of a drought and more recently energy price crisis. Now, the combined effects of the pandemic and the drought led to a drop in uh, activity, which was a higher margin compared to um, what happened during the global financial crisis. On its part, the IMF, of course, deployed some emergency assistance uh, under a blended uh, rapid credit facility as well as a rapid financing instrument. And more recently, we also provided some uh, general allocation of SDRs. But uh, uh, with the coming in of the new authorities, there have been some movement, a swift response uh, to the crisis. In particular, there have been policies which have been implemented to support the health sector, uh, social assistance programs, as well as business activity. But of course, uh, all this was happening in an already difficult context, in the sense that Moldova, as outlined in our governance reports, um, still has a sufficient growth rebound, and uh, there have been some long-standing governance as well as uh, structural constraints. And as you can see on the chart on the right-hand side, uh, relative to its peers, Moldova uh, is lagging uh, in terms of income provisions. So these challenges necessitate a strong policy response, and that's why we, come, we came in with a program, and hopefully, once we conclude, we should be able to work towards addressing these uh, challenges. Next slide, please. So, uh, just to give you a flavor of what is in the program, so what it does is that it addresses the seven core areas that have been identified as key for governance within the IMF. This includes uh, tackling corruption and, uh, and anti-money laundering, strengthening the rule of law, uh, bolstering the regulatory framework, enhancing fiscal governance, uh, boosting financial sector oversight, and safeguarding central bank independence. In summary, the program that we are negotiating includes um, macro critical governance and institutional reforms, which are aimed at strengthening transparency and accountability, uh, public policy predictability, oversight of the financial sector, and fostering deregulation and competition. So once we have the agreed policies appropriately sequenced and implemented, they should be able to deliver some medium-term gains, including a competitive and improved business environment, more private investment, reverse of the brain then, human capital accumulation, and increased productivity. Of course, for this to happen, we need to, uh, it means Moldova will start moving towards an inclusive and sustainable growth path, and that should go the way with the ambitions to income provisions. Last slide. So, as a summary, what we have in the program is three objectives. First of all, to address the, uh, the current pandemic and support efforts to sustain a recovery. And secondly, we want to launch ambitious and uh, uh, macro governance reforms. 
And thirdly, we also want to provide the much needed uh, resources to support infrastructure, education, and health, as well as other pressing issues. Now, the desire to develop this growth-friendly development agenda will need to be balanced with, of course, fiscal and debt sustainability. So subject to implementation of our prior actions, we should be able to go to the board in December. Uh, the program will allow immediate access of around 80 million, immediately we go to the board. Now, let me close by sharing our views on the medium term, since a lot has already been spoken about um, this year. So we expect growth uh, to strengthen and average at about 5%, given the reforms that will be carrying with them, as well as the ramped up support for development objectives. Importantly, while we expect inflation to pick up in the near term, we expect it in the medium term to be broadly aligned with the central bank target. Uh, with regards to the fiscal angle, it is expected to expand over the medium term, reflecting, of course, the desire to attain these development objectives. However, the improvements in revenue and spending efficiency, uh, coupled with the reforms, are expected to ensure debt sustainability. We therefore project debt to remain far below 45% of GDP over the medium term, and this threshold is below what is needed for uh, debt disgrace. Now, these expectations, of course, take into account the pandemic-induced uh, expenditure as well as the uh, uh, developmental objectives. With regards to the current account, given the strong rebound, it's expected to widen in the short term, but it should narrow and remain around 8% reflecting the expenditures. And gross of future reserves, we expect them to remain very, uh, to still remain very strong, uh, ensuring advocacy. Uh, let me conclude by saying clearly, after the recovery becomes well entrenched, we need to transition policies to supporting growth. And in our view, governance and institutional reforms, if decisively implemented, could define the trajectory of the recovery. The success of the reforms we rely on appropriate balance between the reform momentum and fiscal sustainability. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Georges. So just to clarify, that's $560 million over a three-year three -year program? Correct. Uh, $560 million over a three-year program, but with immediate access of $80 million in December if we go to the board. Thank you very much. Um, and Gina, can we just talk about the, uh, the state of play with the World Bank? Um, you've already been... Uh, supporting Moldova, I think, for, for many, many years. But what's the, what are you working on at the moment? Well, thank you, Charlie. I will not have a presentation, but again, if, if, if I would, I would start probably with the same macro background that Rogers has kindly provided for us. And that, that serves as a basis for also our engagement in, in, in Moldova. Um, let me just uh, tell you briefly about our ongoing program and then what the plans will be. Uh, currently, we have a country partnership framework with Moldova that is our strategic uh, program of our engagement. Uh, due to COVID, it was extended for another year, therefore it's, uh, it will end uh, our next hour fiscal year, therefore in June uh, 2022, we should have in place a new engagement program. That's our portfolio is, is around uh, a little bit over 363 million. And as you simply said, we have been a long-term partner uh, with, with Moldova. We have 12 projects in a number of areas, and it's a quite young portfolio, average age is like five, five years. Therefore, I think it's, again, a lot of those projects are still in, in, in active implementation. The sectors covered uh, are diverse. Uh, we, we really stepped up and helped, especially last year due to COVID, with our engagement in the health sector, including providing financing for vaccine procurement. We have a solid problem in, in the energy sector, um, including transmission lines and district heating, education, which uh, I think is something that we probably will touch upon a little bit later. Uh, it's huge importance for Moldova and for good business environment for foreign direct investments to come in. And I think addressing the, the secondary education, but even more so higher education and skills uh, to support growing businesses. Um, we also have uh, 
modernization of government uh, services project that uh, looks at digitization. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to see that the government uh, has involved in a very solid problem in, in digital development. But what comes next? I think we, will, we are starting to work with our counterparts in designing a new program. Usually it's four to five year program. And uh, we are looking at the main focus areas that that will be determined in the next several months. Uh, it clearly will be continuing engagement in building skills and education or general building human capital. It uh, will also look at uh, making business environment more supportive for not only for foreign direct investment, but also for local investment. And it will also be, as Roger mentioned, very strong on capacity building, institution building, and governance. But uh, this is going forward. Uh, in average, uh, the program will be on annual budget it's around 150 million US dollars. Uh, therefore, that that is something that uh, we'll, we hope to uh, agree with the government and in the next, as I mentioned, several months. Um, therefore, that's, I think, on our ongoing program. So that's about a billion dollars of IFI support over the next three years, um, which is very helpful. I do want to get to the private sector in a second, but Ingrid, you said you'd just been there for a few months. What's your... A lot of the people watching online, this might be their first uh, understanding of Moldova. What, what's the first thing that strikes you when you get to the country? When you've been there a few months, what are you, what's the surprise? Oh, yeah, yeah. And actually, whenever you go to a new country, right, you, 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 you look you know, through every, all the available sources and, and social media, whatever it is. What, what really, what really struck me is the wine industry of, of Moldova. And in fact, it's a natural, natural heritage in Moldova. It's, but then I looked a little bit beyond just, you know, being fond of wine. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating story, in fact. And I think this is a, a business that, I think there is there are definitely are some lessons to be learned uh, how this wine industry developed in pretty short time. It's uh, Moldova is is the eleventh largest wine producer in Europe. Uh, it has its own uh, traditional um, wines that I think have been here for thousands of eight of years. Before. And I think building on that is again it's. A, Marketing probably would come in here to help. But I think some of the things that helped this industry, as I said, it was an embargo on, on, on wine, which helped to increase the quality. Uh, and currently, Moldova exports 70% you know, of their wine. Unfortunately, I think at a very low price. And I think this is something that uh, when looking at the investments and, and business investments, I think making sure that all the quality infrastructure that is needed, not only for the wine industry, but for other industries as well, is in place. And, but yeah, but that's what I think I was very happy to learn about. And I'm sure, you know, not every, not many people know that Moldova is in a Guinness record book for its longer, longest uh, underground wine cellars. Before. I think everybody's very welcome to come and drive through them. <laughs> That's very good. Angela, you've been there four years now, um, and I think your background's from Armenia, um, so you might have a different, uh, a different perspective. I'm just curious about what your, how, after four years, you might have moved beyond the wine, or maybe you love the wine as well. But, but what happens, what, what are your impressions now? Thank you, Charlie. Yes, I've moved on uh, beyond the wine. I've even tried the, um, I've even tried the brandy. And I have done a good comparison with Armenian brandy. And I have to say, I like them both. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what have I... Yeah, I mean, I have to say, when I when I first arrived here, what what was really really fantastic to see is how green this place is, 
and I'm not talking just outside of the city, in, in the center of Chisinau, you can find parks like at every step of your way. You can find forests in the center of the city and it's fantastic. I mean, you know, when, when you look about, talk about green, when you talk about fresh air, it's, it's just beautiful, hiking opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. What struck me though, we did arrive on a holiday period and uh, my children we went out for a walk and I couldn't see people. I, I just didn't see the buzz on the streets. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, what, what happened to the people? But of course, everybody just goes to the villages and they were visiting uh, the, the uh, relatives because that was around the Easter time. But still, even when everyone came back, that buzz is just not as much as it could be. And it, it, is, it is evidence of the demogra demographic challenges in this country, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that uh, later on. Uh, but beyond the wine, of course, the food is fantastic. They've got lovely walnuts here, by the way, beautiful honey. I don't know if honey can be beautiful, but it's very tasty. Uh, it's such a fertile land in Moldova that the walnut trees are actually growing on the side of the roads as you drive on the motorway. So it's just... To me, I thought it was going well, but apparently it is not. But there are they are farms, but it's fantastic. Uh, very good climate, uh, long autumns and very nice uh, summers and springs. Winters are nice; they're not as bad as I have seen in, in in Armenia. I must say, you know, it can get quite cold and lots of snow, but here is quite mild. And uh, one of the things that was quite fascinating is the excellent speed of internet. Uh, which was very handy last year because we all had to work remotely. And uh, it is a very developed infrastructure, and but I think there is a lot more room for developing uh, that sector. Uh, one area that could improve, of course, is the road sector. But then again, with the World Bank, with EIB, EU, we're all uh, helping the authorities to fix that. And there are lots of infrastructure projects that we're financing and also helping implementing in the road infrastructure sector. So I can stop here. Oh, I didn't mention the lakes. They have lots of lakes inside the city and outside the city. So fishing is another fantastic thing in Moldova that could develop further. But, uh, you know, it's pretty good when your children are out of school for a short period of time. It's a blessing to have fishing opportunities here. No, that's very, uh, thank you very much for that, that bit of color um, about it all. Um, Rogers, if I could come back to you but a little bit more on the macro side now. Um, you had some background on the Baltic states. Um, what, what's the difference? What are the odds of something as good as that story happening? Where is the opportunity now? Uh, I'd love to get your views on that. Thank you so much, Charlie. Indeed, I, um, I had a, some experience on the budgets and um, looking at the stories, it really uh, strikes you that um, the potential is there uh, and indeed, the issue must be how we transition to that potential. We have done some work within the IMF um, in understanding what went wrong after the transition. And I think it boils down to three things, uh, priorities, policies, and the politics. Now, in terms of priorities, I think uh, what we concluded in the IMF is that uh, for the countries that undertook the front-loaded and board reforms, they were rewarded faster with faster recovery and income convergence. Um, in terms of policies, of course, reforms have been moving at different speeds, crucial areas of governance, business environment, proving more difficult. And here, I think the story is more about uh, vested interests, which connects to the politics, where the political landscape has also been marked by too many changes in government. And this doesn't give enough room uh, for anyone to conduct meaningful reforms. And that's what makes the current conjecture very different. I think Moldova, Moldova now stands at a very uh, extraordinary point where they can break away from the tradition of scope and goal policies. And given that there's now political will, I think if the, if the priorities are properly aligned uh, with the ambitious governance and uh, reform agenda, and if the policies are very decisive and you have firm commitment to reform irreversibility and implementation, and if the political will is still there, to sustain resilience and momentum, this time it will be different for Moldova, and that's how we see it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I'm just, um, when I'm looking at the data, the thing which strikes me is this current account deficit that sits there for, for the best part of, well, more than a decade. I'm just 
how does Moldova build up its export capacity? I, I mean, I could try and drink as much wine as Nguna. I, in fact, I could probably drink more. Um, that would help. Where else is Moldova going to get the export capacity growth from? I mean, is that is that an area that we, sit, we, we might see manufacturing investment? Is there local success stories here? Is there something the EBRD has been involved in? Um, I'm not sure who wants to start with that. I don't have Brian, would you that. like to, yes. to, to jump in? Um, Moldova has indeed improved its uh, export capacity in the last few years. The one area that I'd like to talk about is not wine, but uh, textiles industry. And I'm Miss Moldova today because I'm wearing a dress made in Moldova by one of the local designers. And my necklace also comes from Moldova, so by one of the local accessory designers. Um, and it's interesting to see how the industry has developed because 15 years ago, it was only 5% in a higher margin. So most of it was really in a cut and make, right? And uh, within this time, that higher margin business now improved to 25% of the whole market. And uh, you know, it employs 30,000 people now. It is a big part of the export capacity. And it's important to highlight um, that Moldova is very close to EU, so proximity to EU is great. It's part of the free trade agreement, and uh, it can trade with EU and the former Soviet Union, the CIS states. And of course, the knowledge of the languages, we're talking about Romanian, Russian, English, and French as well, also house with that, right? Um, coming back to agriculture, again, I'll skip the wine industry because I'm sure we'll talk a lot about it. It's um, crops, right? So if we're Comparing Romania and uh, Moldova, in terms of the harvest, it's in, in, you know, obviously this year harvest is great and prices are great because you know great for recovery from last year's drought. Um, it, it's only three tons per hectare in Moldova, and if you compare with Romania, it's five tons a hectare. And the question is why? It, it all has to do with funding. So it's 134. Um, euros per hectare, which is the funding that is received in Moldova, versus 900 in Romania. Obviously, with subsidies and everything else. That's so you can EU. see... The 900 is in the EU, I presume, mostly. It's and the 134 and everything else that you can get. Yeah, yeah. 134 in Moldova is from the government, or...? It's uh, any funding that is available, right, um, for this. And then you can see why, because obviously they need to buy, uh, you know, uh, fertilizers and... Um, you know, any, any other thing that needs to go in there, and there's simply no funding, you know, and the equipment as well. So we're talking Belarusian tractors versus, you know, John Deere or class, and that has a big impact on their productivity. So even within the land mass that there is now here, you can improve the productivity a lot, right? Um, and if we're talking about the EBRD, sort of how do we help, is an interesting um, one that we have started in... Um, Romania, we have a company there, which is called Agricover Holding, and three years ago, um, they started what is called the Farmers Club. So they united the farmers in the country to have that one voice to uh, develop their, um, the, you know, the policymakers to have the qualified response to whatever initiatives are coming from Brussels or from Romania. And the great thing is that, uh, you know, they're very happy to share that with Moldova as well, because they're working with the other European countries to put a joint response to Brussels. Um, and uh, another initiative there is uh, scholarships, because if we talk about agriculture, it's not just putting seeds in the ground and see how it goes. It's a lot more complex than that. You know, we're talking about legislation, we're talking about EU policies. So what they've done um, started with 50 people and then now it's 100 people. And this year for the first time, five Moldovans were included in the program as well. And it's uh, a one year program where the youngsters, as we call them, right, can join, um, uh, basically it, it's uh, several weeks with uh, the lawyers, with uh, you know people in Brussels, um, multinationals, traders, to understand what actually agriculture is about, and it allows them to build uh, a community because obviously they'll keep in touch with those people that have been on the program for a year. They'll have some contacts in Brussels. They'll have the contacts with suppliers, with buyers, introduce them to you know the the buyers in Romania as well, and that's partly hopefully addresses the, the issue of the skills and the issue of uh, first generation farmers don't have the second generation going in, just getting that education and connections with the Romanian and other EU countries. Okay, so you're giving an easy, oh, I don't know about easy, but you're giving an easy win for agricultural output could rise 50% purely on the back of 
of new productivity. That probably needs new financing. It seems to me that the banking system could lend an awful lot more than it does. Um, I'd like to bring this to the central bank, if that's okay, Vladimir, because there's two conflicting issues that I've got as an economist looking at this. I look at that minimum wage of $165 a month and say that's way too low. You could afford a much stronger currency. Um, and yet I look at the current account deficit and say, eh, maybe you need a cheaper currency. I see that Moldova's cheaper than Vietnam in terms of the minimum wage. So you do not need a cheaper currency. I, where do you stand on this? I look back at the last 10 years and I can see a currency that looks to me fairly stable. Um, and you've managed to hold it very well. Uh, we've got a real effective exchange rate model that says it's expensive. I, I don't know what to think. So, what do you think? Well, uh, indeed, we have had uh, a large current account deficit uh, for quite some time now. It, it has been historically with, uh, with Moldova, and it appears to be financed uh, in large part by remittances and by the fact that uh, uh, we have a uh, free visa regime with European uh, Union people can afford to uh, to travel in and out of the country. Seasonal workers, where some of them uh, uh, have permanent jobs outside. Uh, Moldovans have a very strong bond with their country, and they come back. And uh, the recent uh, COVID crisis uh, uh, showed that uh, the level of uh, uh, Procyclical correlation with the uh, uh, with the economic downturn, with the increase in remittances, is is pretty high, uh, and this is what has uh, financed in large the uh, current account uh, deficit. Uh, also, uh, it hasn't been mentioned today, but uh, the IT industry has grown considerably in recent years, and in uh, if I recall it correctly, at the end of 2019, it overpassed the wine industry. So there is a potential there. And we talk about, uh, you, you mentioned demographics. Uh, yes, indeed, that is uh, a concern, but the uh, convergency uh, of uh, uh, wages to the European level is inevitable. The question for the central bank is, uh, what is the quality of that convergence? And if you gain through investments and IT uh, in productivity, that's something good and we welcome very much. But obviously that depends on the quality of policies or the reforms, uh, eliminating the bottlenecks that we have in, in our um, uh, economy. But potential is there. Uh, also the central bank has been a net purchaser of foreign exchange. It was not an artificial uh, uh, maintenance of a stable uh, uh, exchange rate. Uh, and that happened e even during 2020 when mo most of our peers uh, were hit very hard by, uh, by the lockdowns around the world. Now, the trouble with our model is it goes back 25 years. And if I look back at Moldova's numbers from 25 years ago, $400 that, that per capita that, GDP. But that was a different world. Indeed. And therefore, the structural change has been so dramatic since then. That, that is the best counter argument to our, to, to the, to our model. And probably we, we do have an uh, uh, inflation targeting regime, and the central bank would step on the uh, foreign exchange market. Uh, has decreased considerably in recent years. How long years. have you had the inflation targeting regime? Uh, for 10 years now. Okay. And then you've met your target how many times? Uh, well, uh, in the beginning, uh, first uh, few years, uh, uh, Moldova was in the target, but then they are fortunate in that of 2014 uh, hit. Uh, and after that, there was a little bit of yo-yo. Uh, but uh, we have been... Uh, around the, the target and in the target. In 2014 is when the Russians said, well, we're not going to buy Moldovan wine because we're cross with you or something. And, and no, then you- That was 2006. Okay, sorry. Thank you very much. This is just for your education, not mine, obviously. Um, and 2014 then, what was, what was the, the shift? What was the change? Well, 2014 was the, the, the banking fraud. Uh, uh, and following that uh, uh, severe uh, shock to, to the financial sector and to, to the economy, uh, the central bank and the authorities have launched a uh, very uh, deep reform uh, of the banking uh, sector. The okay. I wanted to come to that okay. because the second, the second issue here is the potential for bank lending growth is huge. 
Um, and I, I was talking to somebody about mortgages. So I think we'll hear about that in the next panel. They're three to 4% of GDP. And I get very excited by such low numbers. And I think it could be 30% of GDP. Um, but if you've had banking issues in the past, sometimes the regulator, the central bank, comes in and, and is so conservative and so cautious that the banks are not allowed to lend. So is there a is there pressure on you to now ease up? It's that fraud was seven years ago. It feels like Moldova's made a lot of changes to, to reform the situation since then. Can you let the banking system free? It, can you let bank lending pick up? Uh, absolutely, but uh, I'll go back to uh, what you mentioned that the central bank doesn't allow uh, normally after severe crisis banks to lend. Uh, I would slightly disagree with you. Uh, it's the cause of probably some issues with the supervision, uh, with the corporate governance in the banking sector that have led to the crisis. Obviously, following that, uh, the central bank steps in and brings uh, the legal framework, the primary and secondary legal fr framework, uh, to, uh, to, to let's say, to, to the international best practices. And obviously, it's not something that you change on the paper and it's done overnight. It has to change the culture of doing business, of doing banking in Moldova. And it's not only banks, it's also the clients, uh, the shift from big corporates that uh, were overhanged with, uh, uh, with debt to a different style. It's not like uh, uh, Lombard lending anymore. You have a house and you get uh, uh, the, the money and then you lose the house. Uh, it's different now. The banks have to look at the, the cash flow, of, uh, of the business potential of their clients, and it takes a little bit of time. And of course, uh, moving from Basel one to Basel three in a matter of few years, that was a, uh, let's say, uh, a sprint, a, a huge one, and that had an impact on the banks. As a result, we got probably uh, among our peers with the best uh, banking sector prepared to absor uh, absorb the shock of 2020, and now we see some uh, so, some other shocks related to, to the uh, energy. The banks are very well capitalized. Mm. The uh, interest rates have been stable. The liquidity is very high. The corporate governance and shareholders in the banks have changed radically in the last years. The uh, four systemic banks that account for over 70% of the banking sector are all owned by transparent shareholders and banking groups from uh, from the region, including uh, European countries. Uh, so the potential is there. It's huge. Yes, uh, they say that you can blow on a yogurt if you burn yourself uh, with something. Uh, but, but that also uh, is going to relax a little bit. Uh, let's say currently we have, we go by prudential uh, regulations mm -hmm. and the uh, all capital uh, uh, adequacy indicators uh, uh, look at, at through the prudential uh, 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 provisions. N now, we'll probably move to IFRS in the next coming years. That will release an additional probably 30% of capital in banks, which is huge. If I could just try and set a target just as a number, if mortgages are, say, 4% of GDP today, on a five-year view, 10-year view, what would the central bank be comfortable seeing? Or, well, sorry, if Bayan wants to jump in as well. I'd like to jump in as well. And Sorry, continue challenging the central bank, if I may, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I think there is a quite a, a great opportunity for the mortgages to grow. We're seeing that already in the market. And to me, it's always an indication how well is economy doing and how confident the people are in the country. Because if you're buying something that you're going to be repaying for the next 25 years, then you're likely to stay, right? Um, and there have been you know, great things that the government has done, uh, you know, affordability programs, Prima Casa, the first time you buy a house, then they help you, so it's subsidized program. Um, and the other thing, uh, is also uh, seeing the numbers, right? So if we see in, in Maiv, we can see that last year we were giving, you know, a, a month, let's say one and you a half million. You invest in Maiv, and it's one of the biggest banks in Exactly, Moldova, it's right? one of the biggest banks. It's over 30% of the market. Um, and then this year we are already giving, uh, you know, five million a month. So you can see that trajectory that it is indeed growing. And the question is, 
what can we do or what can the central bank do right to improve on that potentially uh, one of the areas i was thinking is maybe uh, looking into the uh, sector of self-employed because at the moment you have to prove your income in order to get the loan right and that's why there's a bigger industry of non-bank financial institutions because that's where the people go to now um totally understand the concern of the central bank of course right but there are other means these days to assess the credit worthiness of the uh, of the borrower because uh, if you have the financial history and if you have your you know income then it's easy to get uh, a loan on a mortgage if you don't, then what are the other ways that the banks can look into it? Whether it's, you know, payment of rent, payment of utilities, whether it's payment of the, you know, sort of topping up your mobile, you know, the flows on your bank account, how much you withdraw, how much you deposit. So can the central bank give uh, more discretion potentially to the banks to determine the credit worth of the clients and try to bring in the people that at the moment are potentially not served by the banks into the banking system and start with the small loans, you know, a couple of thousand, and then potentially they'll have more disposable income than to save up for their down payment and maybe go into the mortgages later on. So that's one. And the second one is... Uh, I'm conscious of... How long have we got? Yeah. Oh, we have 20 times. I'm just wondering. 10, 10, 20. Oh, okay, okay, okay. good, good. Sorry. So I'll go on the second one. Yes. And the second one is um, digital identification. It's, uh, you know, sort of onboarding. And that's going to live in the UK. You see quite a few people from um, Moldova with Moldovan passports that uh, some of them are likely to stay in Europe somewhere, but quite a few of them would like to go back. And at the moment, you can't open an account or take a loan um, because you're not physically resident in Moldova. So that's potentially another way of just expanding the, you know, the access to fund from uh, there's two funding from, uh, you know, from uh, Moldova to the people who may be outside. But these are just ideas, right? So obviously it's um, up to the central bank too. Perhaps we come back to, to Vladimir in a moment. I would want to bring back in Rogers and Nguna if possible. Um, I would then like to address the energy sector, um, and I'll be bringing in Angela at, at that point. But um, Rogers, Nguna, banking system, as far as you're concerned, it's looking... It's looking decent. Is there, there a lot of potential? I mean, okay, I'm the bullish sell side guy, but it, it does look pretty good, right, for, for the growth prospects, I think. That's a, not a leading question at all. Rogers? Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, as you know, the IMF have worked closely with the authorities um, since 2016. Um, we have focused our efforts in um, cleaning up the issues of shareholding, uh, the shareholding framework. Uh, streamlining ownership, as well as um, strengthening the supervision. I think the work has uh, indeed um, borne some positive fruits. Uh, going into the crisis, banks uh, were relatively strong, uh, strong buffers, and as we can speak, the impact has been uh, less than what happened during the previous crisis, and most importantly, they're already lending. So in our view, the banking sector is thriving. Um, the only issues going forward of concern, of course, is just to strengthen safety nets, given that uh, we'll continue to have shocks. But other than that, I don't think we don't have uh, any immediate concerns. Our concerns would be more into making sure that the same level of regulation that is there in the banking sector is also extended to the other sectors. Thank you. Nguna, you got thoughts on, on this from a World Bank perspective? Yeah, I think it's, I wouldn't, sorry, I would just turn it around a little bit and look, look probably from the entrepreneurship side and competitiveness side. And, and, and that is true that there is a banking sector as, uh, as has been stabilized, but I think that there is a sector that is underserved, I think, in, in, in terms of inputs and, and access to finance, and that's in MSMEs, the mid, small, and medium sized enterprises. And that's one thing that it's also sure we can also, that's one of the things that enterprises mentioned as a lack, a lack, lack of access, but also the skills is another thing. But I think it, uh, if, if it would be good to look at the kind of well-functioning entrepreneurship ecosystem, I think this is something, I hear that there are some nice examples of small uh, like businesses that have become successful and and 
become part of the global value chain. But I think there's something that to be done to make sure that that Moldova's entrepreneurship ecosystem includes really support to entrepreneurship. Um, deals with lack of financing, some this uh, help for business startups, basically also helping to innovate those small enterprises. And also, sure, looking at you know the human capital deficiencies because that is something that the enterprise that especially that want to innovate beyond access to finance, they also need access to uh, technical and managerial talent to, to build those startups and in, in innovation. I think I would really like to see that that is a kind of a package uh, of, of reform that Moldova embraces to make sure that small and medium-sized enterprises can, 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 can flourish in, in Moldova. There's not actually a shortage of savings right now, though, is there? The loan to deposit ratio in the banking system is pretty good. Um, I'm just, Angela, you've got a broader experience background and you're looking more at the private sector as well. Just on this, do you see Moldovan companies suffering from a shortage of capital? Is that, is that the problem? Is that a challenge? What is the cost of borrowing? I mean, just in terms of market interest rates, it's, they, they're pretty low in Moldova, um, is my impression. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You you have that big top down view. Yeah, I have to disagree that there is shortage of borrowing uh, capacity, I mean, capacity and there is shortage shortage of funds that the SMEs and the corporates can access. I think the issue, yes, and uh, the interest rates are relatively low in Moldova. Uh, compared with its peers in the uh, neighboring CIS countries. Um, what we have found is actually the shortage of know-how and adaptability of the companies to, to respond very quickly, especially to the recent crisis. Some of them survived very well because they could respond quickly, they could morph into more of a digital company. Others didn't survive, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm generalizing here, because of course the tourism industry, it was difficult for them to go virtual. But many businesses in the trading sector, they did go virtual and they did survive. And um, we, we, we try to reach out to a lot of the SMEs. Uh, there are some very good entrepreneurs. We have been financing, for example, some very good SMEs who have, became, have become good corporates and have even been uh, bought out by strategic investors. So only recently we, we you know, there's a success story, or quite a landmark story, that the GCC glass container uh, manufacturing uh, company was bought out by uh, Vetropac, and this happened actually during the pandemic just last year. This was a company that EBRD was supporting since the 90s um, and supported through the pandemic, and this is one of the success stories. There are others. We have been involved, for example, in the ICT sector in 2006. I think we invested in some communication. Uh, and through 2016, uh, we supported the company through debt and equity. And in 2016, uh, we exited to Orange, Moldova, which has become uh, the largest uh, mobile communication provider in the country since then. So just a just couple of examples of how smaller companies can also develop, but they do need innovation they do need that impetus to actually go for it do they have shortage of funds i think here we should put it towards the banking sector that the banking sector should also be a bit more creative in their financing uh, structures and the financing um, creativity because financing only on the uh, mortgage based financing is just not going to work in the long run. And I think Brian was quite right that there must be other elements that need to open up in the Moldovan market for the banks to reach out to the customers. Um, so from our end, I would say that the banks actually have so much liquidity that they can support a lot more SMEs and a lot more corporates. But unfortunately, uh, there is also a lack of uh, financial literacy, but this is an area that we're all helping the authorities to tackle. Uh, we are doing some know-how uh, advisory services to help these companies to understand when do you go to the banks? When do you actually 
that borrow did do you need it at all there are some companies who come to us and, and they, they go like oh i want to borrow five million well that's fine but can you actually absorb it yeah but i've got these fantastic plans so there is a lot of education involved in that and of course uh, the banking sector has only recently um been revitalized and i think since then it has been doing well but we would like to see more credit penetration of course um, as you've already mentioned very good uh, does anybody else have, have any comment to jump in on something that's been raised or can i move on to Ed? Vladimir, yes. please well, well on the mortgage lending potential yeah. obviously the central bank uh, looks positively at that uh the mortgage lending has increased threefold since uh, 2017 and potential is there to, to, to grow. Now, if you ask me, would we be happy with a growth that we have uh, observed uh, in Baltics or in other uh, regions uh, around Moldova? Uh, probably not. Uh, we would look at a more sustainable growth. Uh, we would look at the foreign exchange risk that has been involved in, in other uh, uh, countries that has uh, led from a success story to a bust in a matter of uh, uh, five to, to, to eight years. Uh, so we have learned the lessons from our peers, but obviously there is a strong growth potential and uh, we will support it. Uh, we will try to, to avoid uh, um, uh, overheating of the sector. Now about uh, what uh, has been mentioned uh, uh, re regarding the onboarding and the financial inclusion, uh, we are very much supportive of all banks' efforts to get on board and to uh, increase financial inclusion. At the same time, we, as a regulator and uh, an institution that is uh, also has its fair share in uh, uh, enforcing the AML CFT uh, standards, uh, we would probably appreciate more a balanced approach where the financial inclusion comes with bringing from the, uh, let's say, uh, informal economy into the formal economy, not uh, legitimizing informal how economy. Big, and that's big, extremely important for us. How big do you reckon the informal economy is? Well, um, it has historically been uh, at around 40%, but there are, uh, you, you know, different numbers thrown around even up to 60 some years back. Uh, what has happened in the last uh, uh, year or 18 months, uh, uh, one has to look back yet at the at the numbers but we uh, given the level of um, formal import we believe that with the lockdowns uh, the formal eco economy has increased considerably okay just as a tip every time turkey's current account deficit looks quite big they revise up their gdp to include more of the informal economy and then the current account deficit strengths as a proportion of gdp it's a great trick um, i recommend it um i I'd like to talk just about energy sector as well, because we're all having some issue in Europe right now about natural gas prices. From my ignorant position, it seems to me Moldova's just signed a deal that sorts that out for five years. Um, Angela, I know you've got a, a view on this. I'm just curious about, is, is, that, is that fair assessment that we've now sorted the problem out? No worries on the, on the natural gas side for five years. And over the next five years, is Moldova going to transition towards a more renewable setup? Just had COP26, big deal. What's, what's the story on the, on the energy side from your perspective? Well, this wasn't the first time that Moldova saw some um, crisis in the energy sector. And energy security has been very high on the agenda for the authorities. And for EBRD, it is actually part of our uh, um, strategy for the uh, five years, in, in the past five years. Um, in 2019, a similar situation has happened. Um, Moldova survived with the help of uh, its friends like EBRD and other IFIs. Um, this time again, uh, there was the energy crunch, and it actually brought up opportunities for Moldova to test something which they had never done before which was procuring uh, gas in the open markets through tenders. This was the first time that they launched the tenders in uh, October to compensate for the uh, temporary shortages um, of the October month, and it worked. So they proved that this can happen. 
Uh, is this the right time to diversify? Well, I have to say, um, Moldova has been working towards diversification for quite a few years. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Ingo now. Uh, together with the World Bank, EIB, EU, uh, EBRD has invested in the back-to-back -back electricity station uh, project uh, with Moldova, with Romania. So this is an opportunity that in the near future, let's just say 24, 25, uh, Moldova will be able to trade electricity uh, with its European partners. Um, Moldova had also launched the construction of a gas pipeline uh, with um, Romania, which was finalized and put into operation this year already. Again, EBRD was a financier, is a financier in this project uh, alongside EIB. So efforts have already been made to uh, address the energy security of Moldova. But I think this latest crisis has brought up the urgency to actually use these resources that are there and to focus perhaps on utilizing the renewable resources going forward. Right now, Moldova is getting its electricity from, I think, 80% of it from gas and 20% from renewable resources, but out of that 20%, only 6 to 8% comes from uh, wind and solar resources. And as I mentioned in my impressions of Moldova, this is a sunny country. It has capacity for solar energy. And uh, the government has already been thinking of uh, running the competitive tenders for renewable resources, but it has been taking some time. I mean, there have been changes in the government and hopefully with the stability that we're all hoping for in the next few years, this will change and these tenders will uh, get on the way. Uh, just the numbers of the resources of, that, that will be tendered out, uh, currently about 168 megawatt is supposed to be sourced from renewables and 113 megawatt of that should be from tendered resources and 55 megawatt of that would be from feeding tariff. But I understand that the current authorities are revising these numbers upwards, so there will be more possibilities for private investments into the renewable resources going forward. All we need to complete is the technical uh, advisory and then agree on the ways to move forward to, to adjust the legislation and the regulatory frameworks to for the country to actually launch these tenders. So all these energy crunches have created the necessity to move into a different, more diverse energy mix. And this is probably the right time already because the gas pipeline is operational and the back-to-back -back electricity station uh, works have already been, they are actually in the process of being procured. So this coupled with the willingness of the government to diversify its resources, I think in the next five years, we can see uh, more opportunities for Moldova not to get in the crisis mode that it has happened to get in 19 and this year. Interesting. Is there anything to add from that in Guna? No, I think that uh, Andrew has said it very well. I think there's, you know, sometimes crisis provide you with an opportunity. And I think this is exactly the situation. I think it's, it, it makes all the sense to look now what other, uh, how to diversify what the way from just basically single source. Single source. And renewables uh, definitely should be on the agenda. Uh, along with increasing energy efficiency, I think as well, that's untapped potential as well, because you have to have both sides, you have to diversify the sources, but you, so you should have also efficient use of those resources. So I think it's, it's, it's really, I think it would be, I, I'm sure we'll see that the government will, will just jump at it and, and we'll, we'll, we'll have a way forward that is much more energy security for, for the country. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to have a Q&A before the end of this. Um, for those in the audience, I don't think we can do this online, or at least I'm not capable. Um, but first, I did want to get onto this demographic issue. Uh, just all lastly, I wanted to talk about demographics. Um, I've been struck by it. It's an East European story. People didn't have kids in the 1990s. 
we've, we've had a number of countries increase their retirement age, um, and that has helped uh, compensate for, for the aging societies. Um, but, but Moldova's got this extra issue. I think it's 600,000 Moldovans have got EU passports, and, and so it's it, Romanian passports. So they, it's been very easy for, for people to leave, leave the country in quite a big way. I'm just wondering, what, what are the next few years hold? Does it create an inflation problem for the central bank because wages are going to go up, or, or does that get matched with productivity because companies have to invest in technology, robots, to replace the lack of labor, so actually productivity goes up a lot. Um, and I'm just curious about how, how people see the demographic story playing out here. Um, where shall I start? Bayan is, is putting a hand up, brave woman. <laughs> you, and it, it's, it's probably both, right? I mean, they have to invest in productivity. The textile sector that I mentioned, it, it has to be computer-based design and computer-based manufacturing, because if you are producing for, you know, Max Mara or Barbo, they expect a certain, you know, levels of quality. Um, and, you know, I just already mentioned agriculture, because you have to invest into infrastructure, into uh, you know, new machinery, and uh, um, technologies as well, and something that um, you know Romania benefited because, of course, all you know there's a lot of EU money went into it, so they upgraded their silos, the equipment, their machinery, um, and that's something that we put, sorry would lead to productivity, right? Um, and the question of um, labour is um, a pressing one because how do you bring in the people who I know that there are Moldovans who would like to come back to the country, and they're top managers or middle managers in other countries. How do they get to know about the opportunities that there are in the country? You know, you hear it from word of mouth, but otherwise, is, is there a platform that uh, you know all the potential um, you know vacancies are sort of folded in there, or um, it, 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 and then basically the question is whether uh, it's a priority to bring in the the skilled people because then they'll bring new expertise, uh, they'll bring in. Um, innovation and then the rest would follow um or whether it's you know a question of focusing on the lower market right because to me it, it, it's always kind of more on, on the skilled professionals my my guess i mean i've lost a lot of very good people back to poland because the capita gdp is well the minimum wage anyway seven eight hundred dollars and that seems to be seven hundred or so and that's enough particularly when your average wage is that much higher usually double it's enough for people to say my quality of life is better in warsaw than it is in london um, and it's not not an, a hard argument to make, um, given some of the challenges here. So, but $160 minimum wage, let's say the average wage is double that. That doesn't seem high enough yet to get so many people back to Moldova. So I would guess that that your that's that's not wages aren't high enough. So there is going to be wage inflation at some point, as you as you talked about. Where how does the central bank manage that? Uh, well, uh, again, the central bank is. Uh, uh, targeting uh, inflation, right? The the, uh, uh, mer uh, the the instruments that the central bank has in its uh, uh, portfolio uh, have uh, a lot of leverage, but it's not enough. Uh, as you have uh, heard uh, earlier, uh, the government that was supported largely by the diaspora, but by the people who have the potential and skills to come back to Moldova. Uh, that, that's already a very good sign. Then uh, what we heard from the prime minister was that uh, there is a deputy prime minister that is responsible for digitalization. So that, that's going to come. Uh, would it be easy? Probably not. Uh, would it happen overnight? Probably not. But if the right policies are in place, uh, if you look, uh, find a sustainable path to attract those people, the potential is there, it's huge. Uh, you have people that uh, have spent a lot of time outside of the country, so they have the skills, they have the knowledge, they felt what, uh, how, how differently an economy can, uh, can work. Uh, if you can uh, develop the appropriate conditions in the country, uh, we can benefit. And, and you, you brought the example of, uh, of Poland. We're not there yet, but the potential is there. And hopefully with the right policies, uh, with the support, an appropriate investment, uh, we, we would reach uh, that, that uh, stage. Thank you very much. Now, on the questions thing, it gets very complicated because the online audience can't hear the questions. So I will repeat your questions, so make sure it's 
quick. Um, who, if anyone has got a question um, to, to pose on Moldova, please put your hand up and, and yell loudly and I will try and repeat it. Is there a... Uh, sir? Yes. Uh, Not too long because I will actually... Sure, uh, yeah, Moldova is uh, quite often presented in textbooks uh, as a landlocked uh, country. In fact, uh, there is an international free port of Giorgio Lestri and the IBRD has taken over the ownership of the port this year and announced uh, that a second grain terminal will be built. Uh, are there plans to make this uh, gateway more transparent place to do business like London Stock Exchange, for example? So just to, to repeat that question in case you, you didn't hear Angela, um, there's a land port um, which is being, uh, the EBRD has been an investor in, um, it, it, in many ways stops Moldova being a landlocked country, this land port. Um, is there plans to expand and then to increase transparency and, and what's your expectations for the growth in that story? Is that fair? Did I Thank not hear it right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, indeed, uh, the port of Jujulur CBRD has been an investor there since the early 90s, and we continue being an investor. And yes, in May uh, 2021, we were compelled to take over the port. Um, the port is actually working uh, pretty transparently, and uh, the transparency of the port activities are something that we will be ensuring going forward anyway. The capacity of the port, however, is a bit of an issue because there are certain elements that would need to be completed for the ports to have a bigger capacity to house more residents. At the moment, I think the port is working at its, uh, I think, 60% capacity than what it was supposed to be doing in uh, when it was established. Uh, but hopefully in the future there will be uh, some expansions and the port will be able to provide more uh, resources for investors. We we're talking about the grain terminals. Yep, there are opportunities there. Uh, there are some larger ones who have already taken over some of the capacities as residents. But there are opportunities and the port management is actually uh, very openly uh, discussing this with interested investors. So. I don't know who asked the question, but I'm happy to put you in touch with the port uh, management that you can discuss it very openly, very transparently further. Sounds good. Um, any other questions? Sir? Um, yeah, maybe to the National Bank, one question. Uh, I think roughly one third uh, of loans are at its loans in the country. And you said you're quite aware of, of the mistakes other countries make with regard to that. Now, how do you see the risk uh, currently of that FX group, and, and how do you tackle that risk? If I could just ask for the online audience, FX lending, maybe one third of loans are already foreign exchange, in foreign exchange. How do you manage the risks? How do you well, see well the risk? th that is uh, the, the lowest dollarization level uh, among uh, peers uh, in the region. Uh, that because the we had. Uh, policies that would uh, prevent excessive foreign exchange exposure for, uh, for the borrowers that don't have a natural hedge that helped us maintain that very comfortable level of uh, uh, foreign exchange exposure that can be managed. Of course, <clears throat> there are lots of uh, discussions about uh, relaxing it and allowing everyone to borrow as much as they want in the currency they want. Uh, we are very open to discuss uh, each uh, individual situation, uh, but the central bank policy is to be prudent and to avoid uh, ex excessive exposure to foreign exchange risk. Uh, the loan, uh, ex loans exposure to uh, foreign exchange is uh, slightly below a third. It's below a third. And on the deposit side, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have, uh, I think it's around 40%. Is that euros or dollars? Uh, a share of, uh, both. <coughs> it's both, mainly euro. Um, I'm just, uh, so you just, uh, it just gave me a question, but I've now forgotten it. Um, did that answer your, yeah. your question? Um, oh yeah, your peers, who are your peers? Who do you think your peers are? Because I was looking well, at Estonia well, and Latvia. We'll look at uh, Baltics, they, they are much ahead of us. 
looking at Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, even Romania. Romania now the dollarization rate or euroization rate is much lower, but they went through an episode of uh, uh, bust on the, uh, related to the foreign exchange exposure to the mortgage lending. As many other I countries in the region. I remember it. I remember it well. I was um, at a bank involved in that boom and bust. I was at the um, IMF at the time, and I was looking for some of the uh, analysis on the on the region. Yes. Um, yeah. Difficult times. So, so I totally understand. I'm very pleased that you've got that cautious. That you've got the memory of that boom and bust because yeah. there is huge potential. You just don't want it to but, to do look, that. We want to be. We are very open. We encourage it because if you have lending to, uh, or to to households and mortgage lending that anchors their presence in the yeah, country yeah, yeah. that brings a lot of externalities yeah. uh, to the economy to the development and we are very much aware about that for sure um, any other questions from the audience okay well we possibly are going to wrap up about now says the lady in the pink dress um, thank you very much indeed my panelists for joining us today and, and for, for coming in from everywhere. Um, thank you very much. I hope there was something useful there. Any questions, do email us and, uh, and we'll obviously get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And uh, um, I am delighted to introduce our next panel, uh, which I will be moderating. So um, we, uh, by the way, good timing because you, was, you, you started this, uh, this panel, Charlie, 10 minutes early, so we have just uh, hit it right on time. So hopefully uh, our next panel will also be able to finish slightly earlier to move on to our networking lunch with Moldovan Wine Tasting. So can I uh, please introduce our speakers? Uh, Georgi, Vasil, uh, Owen, please uh, do join me on the stage. And we'll have the wrong slide on the screen. We do have a wrong slide on the screen. Okay. So. So the previous panel focused uh, quite a lot on the macro, and you heard obviously from the central bank, EBRD, IMF, on uh, on what the prospects are for the region. I think for this panel, we would like we actually our, our idea was to drill down a little bit and actually hear from the corporates, from the from the horse's mouth about um, about what's coming for uh, what's next for for Moldova and for Moldovan economy. So I'm delighted to present um, um, the the speakers here, Georgi. Uh, Shagiza, who is the CEO of Maib, uh, Vasil Tofan, who is the chairman of uh, Prokari Wineries, and um, um, and Owen, sorry, I forgot your last name. Woods. Yes, Woods, uh, who is the CTO of, uh, of Endava. And we're going to talk about their businesses in Moldova and what their perspectives are. So uh, maybe uh, in terms of uh, introductions, maybe once I, whilst, once I, uh, I ask a, the first question, if you could kindly maybe introduce yourselves as well a little bit more and also your businesses. So Georgi, let's start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about um, Maib and how you approach creating a modern financial ecosystem in Moldova? Sure, and uh, thank you. Thanks for the question and thanks everyone for being here online and uh, in person. Now in two words about myself, I joined Maib in uh, February this year before my, um, I was CFO of TBC Bank, uh, which is listed uh, here on the premium segment for 10 years. And before that, I worked for across many banks, including Barclays here in London, in Dubai, back in London, and uh, so on. Uh, just before I start about uh, Maib, I want just to highlight few macro numbers that uh, uh, the previous panelists have uh, gone through, but the ones that are very important for banking. Uh, number one, this is um, a clearly low debt to GDP environment uh, with a very stable currency rate, and this is this is very important. And uh, the fact that there is active integration with European Union with up to 70% export going to EU, 60%, 50, 50, up to 50% 50 import from EU, 
600,000 Moldovans having the uh, EU passport. This is very important when we speak about the actual integration. And I go to see my uh, customers, corporate customers, many of them manufacture goods with the tags already on the goods for the end user European consumer. So that there is a real everyday on the ground integration with the European Union. And this is uh, much bigger than uh, than it uh, seems from the first look. So that's to start with. Then when we go to the banking sector, few numbers here are very important. Um, capitalization is very strong. Uh, we are about 20% in total capital. Now, liquidity is very strong. Uh, liquidity ratio for our bank, for example, is about 48%, like super strong uh, liquidity numbers. There were questions about dollarization, especially in the context of mortgages, dollarization or uh, eurozation in mortgages uh, uh, in our bank is uh, quite close to uh, 1%. So this pretty much does not uh, exist. Uh, there is uh, some euro book which is uh, which is mostly mostly incorporated. So this is very good uh, foundations to start. When we go to Maib, we are the largest bank uh, in the country with the market share of about uh, 35%. Uh, and uh, if you think about the landscape of the banking sector, the next bank has about 19% uh, uh, of the market share in, in, in loans. And so we are 35, we represent uh, more than one third of the sector if we, th if we think about the, 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 the loan market share. And loans does represent uh, the, the, the positioning in such countries. Um, we, we, have, uh, we, we just now refreshed the strategy and we want to build on our strengths and uh, transform the bank. And the biggest transformation that we will be going through will be transforming the bank uh, from, um, from traditional uh, linear structure to more agile, more uh, small units uh, structure, whereby people will be working in small teams and focusing on, uh, on the results. And we have tons on, of initiatives, uh, as you would expect, but they can be grouped into four areas. Uh, number one, this is uh, we want to put the customer first and in the center of everything we do. We just did the brand refreshment, the brand you see here, it's, uh, we launched um, in uh, 7th of, uh, of October. We launched a new model of the, of the branches in the next uh, two years. We will be changing all the branches with more transparent, more quicker services uh, where, you, where the customers get the service from. Uh, one place uh, more open, more uh, with, a, with new colors and so on. Now, we are simplifying the procedures and we really want to put the customer in the center, just not to say it, but in every decision we, we make, we want to put the customer in the center. Number two, this is important. These are our initiatives in the digital space. And uh, here uh, we already have very strong presence, but on top of it, we want to orchestrate ecosystems. We recently launched the uh, marketplace for automobiles, and this will be advanced towards the uh, firstly ecosystems and in the future in the super app uh, territory as well. So this is uh, very important to become orchestrator of the ecosystems in the digital space in the country. Number three, this is clearly IPO, and this is the reason why we are here at this stage, we have not launched anything as you would understand, but we are exploring very actively. And number four, this is important, and this is the last, it's to go to the, in, in the region with digital products and uh, start offering our product and services. Firstly, to Moldovans who live uh, outside Moldova, and uh, that's where digital onboarding and all the digital procedures comes and uh, then uh, then we can extend these services uh, to others uh, others as well. So this is very 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 briefly about us and uh, our aspirations. Thanks, uh, Georgi. And this is what the Prime Minister has been speaking about, right? Digitization, um, agility, but also of course your IPO consideration, which will have a lot of the impact on all the steps that you're doing right now in terms of governance, uh, risk management, and all of those things that you will 
need to start putting into place from today. Uh, but I have all the confidence as you, knowing that you have a lot of experience bringing uh, companies uh, to, to the public market. Um, uh, Owen, I'll, uh, I'll um, um, uh, move on to you. So, uh, of course, you represent Endava, the, um, uh, the well-known provider of uh, modern uh, di uh, digital technologies. And I know that you have substantial business in Moldova. Could you tell us a little bit more how this all started and what, where, where you are today? Certainly. Yeah, I think it's a good story. So my name is Owen Woods. I'm probably the only person in the room who's not a financial professional. Um, <laughs> I'm normally in a room full of technology professionals with business people feeling a bit isolated. Now I know exactly how you feel. Um, I have never been more thankful for the minor in economics I did in my software engineering degree, so I can follow the conversation. So we're a technology company. When we talk about digital transformation and digital systems, that's what we do. We build them for other people. So we build them for large multinationals. We build them for fintech startups here in London. We build them for people on Silicon Alley in New York. We build them sometimes for governments, and sometimes we build them for quite small companies who are attacking, attacking big companies. Um, the, uh, Moldova has been a very important part, part of the Endava success story. We're now well over 8,000 people and continue to grow strongly. Moldova's been part of that story since the very beginning. Endava was founded in London in 2000, mainly as a software, in, software consultancy company. So relatively small numbers of people advising clients, doing small amounts of high-end work. We very, very quickly realized this was well before my time. I've been with the company about seven years. This, um, but the company quickly realized it needed scale in terms of delivery of software. And it needed that at an affordable cost. Um, it didn't want to go to existing large markets. And a company was funnily, funnily enough founded in the same year, although of course the people in London didn't know it at the time. A group of Moldovan software engineering experts who were also very entrepreneurial founded CompuDava in Chisinau in 2000. A couple of years later, um, well, well, the company that pr predated the Indava name, Concise, met, met CompuDava, the two came together, and Moldova became our first scale software engineering center, starting from very modest beginnings of about 25 people, I think. Um, it's now um, one of our largest software engineering centers. If you just think about that for a minute, the size of Moldova. Moldova is one of the smallest countries we operate in, and it's got one of the largest software engineering centers. And that tells you everything you need to know about the success we've had in Moldova and how important Moldova's technical professionals are to our success, along with many other countries too. We have lots of people in, um, uh, in Romania, for example. We have people in Latin America. We have people in Serbia. So we are in many countries, but Moldova has always been an important part of that. And why? Well, Moldova has a good supply of well-trained, highly intelligent, very determined technical professionals coming out of three or four key universities. We hire a lot of people from those universities. In fact, our staff go back and teach in those universities now. So we have strong links into a very strong university sector. We find that Moldovans are very, very keen to work with people from abroad in whatever working style they want to work in. And actually that's important. If you've worked with people from other cultures, you'll know that they would often like to work in their culture. We found repeatedly Moldovans are very happy to meet people halfway and work out the best way to work. And they're technically skilled, they're good problem solvers, and the very determined people. And I don't know if that's a national trait or we hire the determined ones, but I can assure you when we give the Moldovan Delivery Center a big difficult problem, such as recently we gave them a huge, very complicated system for a large international payments company that must remain nameless, they just simply took the challenge on head on and succeeded. There were a number of other delivery centers, I think, privately thinking, I'm very glad that went to Moldova. That really didn't look like a lot of fun. But they, they, they overcame, and they have done it many times for us in 20 years. So that's the short story of Indava and Moldova, and why it's one of the countries that has been very important to us, very dear to my heart. I love visiting Kishina, and I miss it so much since COVID-19, but I hope I'll be able to go back soon. Um, and everyone, what everyone says is true. They're very warm, lovely people, but they have fantastic food, and they have fantastic wine. So don't miss out, don't miss out on an opportunity to visit them. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I mean, uh, that sounds when you're saying when you were talking about the can do attitude and the immense sort of, um, you know, uh, expertise in, in, in software technology sounds really familiar. And that I, and then I absolutely I think it is not a surprise that you have, you know, uh, your biggest delivery center in, in, in Moldova. But also, I think that also develops into a new theme is um, I think what uh, Angela was um, uh, actually touched on is there are a lot of the areas outside agriculture that, that can develop. And one of those could be renewable energy, for example, solar power, uh, could be you know, uh, transportation such as with ports, but also the software and technology. 
and we're seeing similar trends in the region, right? Uh, in, in across Eastern Europe, actually, where you see people, uh, this, this enormous human talent really um, um, expediting, I think, the development of local economies. Absolutely, right, right from, I don't want to take away focus on Moldova, but right from the Adriatic coast across to Moldova, yeah. we find that there is tremendous depth of human capital, Moldova exactly. being one of the great examples. Right, Vasil, well, so moving on to you, you have two hats. Uh, obviously, you're an investor in Moldova through Horizon Capital. You're also the chairman of Kokari Wineries, uh, which is, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, the wine industry. So uh, maybe we'll start with the investor perspective, uh, if you don't mind. So from, from your perspective, uh, what are some of the insights about, um, uh, practical insights about your experience um, uh, in Moldova? And what are your thoughts about this investment climate? climate? Yes, thank you, Ayona. First of all, I really have to start by uh, mentioning that the wine tasting is at 11.30 in the morning. I think, <laughs> I think having a wine tasting in the morning, that's the best selling point you can have for an event like this. So you're all welcome there. It's so, 1.30 in Moldova, it's fine. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's almost, it's almost evening in, in China, you know, so that's usually all fine. So uh, on a serious note, uh, indeed, I, I wear several hats here. So maybe I'll start with, with the hat as um, a Moldovan investor. So I'm a partner with Horizon Capital, which is a private equity fund with a little over a billion uh, under management, which is a sizable amount for, for the region we cover. We focus on emerging uh, Europe region. Uh, I, I'll start by saying that uh, we've done actually quite a lot of investments in uh, Moldova. I counted it, as I said. So we've done 10 investments in Moldova over the years. And I'm very proud to say we never lost money in Moldova, not a single time. And typically we actually made good money in Moldova. And I understand we have regulators here in, in the room too, so I shouldn't brag too much about the returns we delivered, but given we have a pragmatic, occasionally cynical uh, audience here of investors who are very, uh, say, returns focused and uh, uh, risk returns uh, focused, I'll say that typically we're returning over a typical uh, uh, holding period for a private equity fund, which is, you know, four, five, six years, we typically made uh, on, on median three times our, uh, our money, cash, cash on cash in these investments. And I say this uh, not to brag about our returns, I say it mostly that I think in, in many respects, Moldova has been one of the overlooked destinations. And uh, maybe sometimes the media headlines didn't do justice uh, to the country, because I understand it's always a juicier story to pick up some of, say, the the, the more negative element, you know, the, the, the more kind of striking elements, but lots of uh, very success, lots of success stories have gone unnoticed. And I think our, the experience of our fund is uh, a good example of that. In several uh, cases, we've been actually so, uh, so um, say excited about the results we had in Moldova that we decided to back companies on, on multiple occasions. Naive is a good example. We've been an investor in the 2000s alongside TPRT. We've returned over nearly four times our money during a, if I'm not wrong, like five years holding period. And 10 years after that, we, we decided to go for, for another investment. Again, because we believe in the country, we believe in the bank, and uh, we, we felt very comfortable to enter this investment alongside our partners from EBRT and Invalda. That's, that's, that's one example. So another example is uh, the, the wine company we backed, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll share more about that, uh, that story. Again, it's, uh, I think in the case of Pokal, you can bring to life some of the, say, the, the strengths Moldova ha has. So one of the strengths is indeed, say, the, the quality of the people and the relative low cost of doing business in, in, in the country. And on the other side, I think it's the, the quality of the people and the quality of the assets. Uh, enables you to to say to sell products to the world as at a relative uh, good pricing and, and enjoy some pricing pricing power and in the case of Porcari, for example we've published the results today because it's a listed company you know this leads to the highest EBITDA margin of any global wine company so literally we benchmark ourselves with all the wine companies in the world and we have the highest EBITDA uh, margins worldwide so in Q3 we announced the EBITDA margin of 38 percent you'll agree probably there's not Typically, a consumer goods company has a gross margin, you know, in the 30s, 40, 40%, 40 like a good consumer goods company. We, we are a consumer goods company with an EBITDA margin of 38%. You'll agree it's quite remarkable. And the reason we're able to do that is because, again, although it gives, gives us kind of what we not call the best of both worlds, we get the lower cost of operations in the country, but also are able to extract the quality that enables us to get the pricing power to lead to those margins. Wonderful. And then... Uh, um Tell, tell us a little bit more about um, the, the wine industry overall. 
uh, how, how does this work? Who are your major um, uh, exporting uh, partners, etc.? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy, you know, uh, I'm a, uh, I consider myself to have the best job in the world because I'm a bit of a kind of a overpaid sommelier, you know, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally waiter, which you're going to see uh, just shortly from now. But uh, it's a fascinating business, indeed, an industry. You know, the kind of the running joke for the wine industry, and I'm a little bit embarrassed about this joke, is that how do you make a big fortune, uh, how, do you make, how do you make a small fortune in wine? And the answer is that you have to start with a big fortune, you know, and it's simply the, the reason wine traditionally was this quite difficult industry, you know, to, to, to crack, and uh, maybe because too many hobbies went into it and, uh, and, and so on. So it's a global, it's a very fragmented industry, but what we've discovered is that with the right strategy in place, with the right uh, uh, delivery location in place, uh, it can become actually a very, very, very good business. So in our case, we have our, um, our operations in Moldova and, and uh, Romania. We're, saying to, we're selling to the world, but our primary delivery market, so selling market is Central Eastern Europe. This is where we, we focus on. And uh, I have to say that uh, with pride actually, as a Moldovan, that Moldova is a bit of a superpower in the wine world. I know it sounds very pretentious, but I'll just give you some stats. So Moldova has a comparable number of, uh, comparable acreage of vineyards with Australia, which is a continent, right? So Moldova is a tiny country, Australia is a continent. We have almost the same, uh, say, acreage of vineyards. It has actually a comparable acreage of vineyards with South Africa and New Zealand put together. Again, both South Africa and New Zealand, big exporters, kind of uh, well-known uh, um, uh, wine country names, and you know, Moldova is comparable to both of them taken together in terms of the acreage. So that's the starting point. So it's a good, uh, so it's a place where you have the raw, uh, raw materials. I, I think so that's, and that's the, say the, the basis for any successful wine business. The next is, <coughs> the next is um, uh, of course the country brand. And I think where Moldova has been struggling is indeed, you know, we're not perceived as a, as a, as a, as a say, very well-known, strong country brand. And in that sense, I think the uh, Russian embargoes, we had, and we have two, we had one in 2006, we had another one in 2013, was a blessing in disguise of sort. I think the vice governor also mentioned this in his uh, allocation. So it was a blessing in disguise because uh, we traditionally have, we have been shipping wine to the Russian market, you know, but after the series of these embargoes, we decided that, look, it's actually not the most predictable market to do business with. So we fully reoriented our, our export to the European markets and it has worked uh, actually wonderfully for, for us. And, and uh, I think Georgia is another, another good example of, um, of a country that managed to position its brand on the global, uh, on the global uh, wine markets. I'm looking now at Georgia with some jealousy, you know, so just to give you a stat. So Georgia is number four in the world in terms of the price per liter of exported wine, you know, just, be, just behind the, uh, just behind uh, Italy, but uh, ahead of Spain and ahead of many other wine, uh, traditional wine countries, you know. So Moldova is still, I'd say, at the bottom of that, uh, of that ranking. So we're still exporting at relatively low uh, price per liter on average, but the, 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 the pricing power is increasing very, very fast. Thank you, Vasil. And uh, we joke, right? That you, Yogi somehow always manages to stay close to the wine <laughs> in Georgia, in Moldova, and uh, everywhere you go. Okay. Um, right, fantastic. So um, I actually, so so with this, thank you very much for this introduction, in detailed introductions. Um, I think I want to um, to now open up for a discussion. I'll just have actually one question for you all and then feel free to jump in and, 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 to, and to comment. So um, the UK has just ho hosted the, um, uh, as you know, COP26 summit. Um, and ESG has been at the forefront of the agenda of many institutional investors and including those present today and uh, online. Um, so I'd like to have this open discussion about various aspects of ESG, environmental, social, and governance, um, and, um, and, and actually hear from you how do you think uh, these themes are developing, developing in Moldova. So who wants to start? Yeah, so from our perspective, yeah, the ESG, specifically starting with governance, when we have the ambition to uh, to grow, we are regulated business uh, to be listed is uh, is critical. And then again, uh, in terms of the penetration, we are at twenty two percent as loan to GDP and four percent as mortgage uh, loans to GDP. So when you when you grow, it's clearly very important that you have proper governance, proper uh, risk management, and our shareholders. And you all know we be at the is committed to the improvement of the governance uh, on our journey to IPO we will be doing 
uh, even more. Uh, I think the other thing to highlight, which we have started, is uh, the transparency uh, and uh, very uh, transparency in fee and commission structure. And then we are acting as the exemplary, and we will be improving on that uh, front uh, as well, because this is important that our customers, especially in the development stage where they do not have very good uh, understanding of every detail of the product, uh, for us, it's key so that we explain to them um, the details, the payments of the of the uh, of the of the financial products, including or starting with the loan. So this is where we started as the exemplary. And then there are there are many more initiatives uh, to be to be added on this. But it's very important. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to comment on this. Uh, you know, for us, ESG is not uh, is not a tick the box kind of exercise. We really take it seriously, and uh, you know, it's also driven by say the the kind of financial partners we had over the years. You know, like IFC and EBRT and other IFIs, but also the 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 the, the funds invested who are increasingly vocal about these issues. And we have some some of these funds present today. But you know, when even as a smaller issuer. When you have sophisticated funds like you know like Aberdeen or Fiera or you know Firebird like East Capital, you know and Deutsche Asset Management and uh, and so on, so the list is quite long. Like you, you do have to take these things uh, seriously, and actually we're feeding in a good way the the, the pressure of uh, up, further upping our ESG game. So in I think um, in Moldova's case, still the focus is primarily on uh, at the moment, and I want to be transparent about this. Is the focus is on the S and the G side of it, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe I'll say now one thing that. Uh, May, may may not sound as very popular, but I think we still have to work a lot on the S side. So I'll give you a number that will be a little bit shocking to many of you, but I just checked the GDP per capita ranking globally, you know, and still Moldova, a country at the center of Europe, fits right between Nigeria and the Republic of Congo, you know, not the Democratic Republic, but the Republic of Congo still, you know. So so in that sense, like we're still a country that is truly frontier at the, at, 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 in the middle of Europe. So there's a lot of work to be done to raise the quality of living, to raise the standards of, uh, of living. And that, yes, on one side, that's say maybe that that, that may be perceived as uh, as oh my god like a country in europe that is uh, is just uh, just around african countries but it's also it also means opportunity it also means opportunity to let the market work and help help rise the, the social standards and as for Kari, i'm very proud of you know we have thousands of farmers you know many of them small farmers dependent on us for their livelihood you know we have thousands of people you know from growth speakers to 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 like vineyard cutters and so on who depend on, uh, on the lab livelihoods for us and this s translates nicely into g because you know it's not easy to 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 be a company operating in a in a say in agricultural uh, segment and at the same time do things the proper way so we pay all of our taxes you know we are big for audited for over 10 years and so on so i think we're also contributing to the g side you know we cannot take shortcuts there so I, and i think that that's also i think we also um, you know are helping for for the entire entire sector entire industry to transition into higher standards for s and for g but increasingly we really focus on the on the e side too for us that means using uh, lower weight bottles you know uh, that 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 means innovating with with packaging. That means you know planting our share of trees. So really, uh, I think you know when you have a 38 percent EBITDA margin, you can you can allow uh, yourself doing some of those things. And uh, again, it's one of the, the priorities we have to attract more of the ESG focused funds in our capital structure. Uh, for me, ESG, if it's impactful and genuine, is simply a reflection of your company culture. Otherwise, there's a danger. It's an add-on that has very little impact on the way the company operates. And culture is very, very important to Indava. We're a people business. Therefore, culture is absolutely key to everything we do. And we've always tried to build a very strong culture. One of the things that has struck me uh, right across our Central and Eastern European countries is how privileged many of our staff members feel in their communities. They realize that they are largely living you know, Western European lifestyles, they're working in Western European environments. They, for example, in Kishinev, we've got the prestige office block. It was widely featured in Central and Eastern Europe as the best office block in, in Moldova. I have no idea if that's true, but there was a lot of hype about it. And they are very aware that maybe their fathers or their uncles or their cousins don't have the same advantages. So a lot of our staff hold us to account on that, that the social impact that we have in, our, in the places we operate is very important to them. And that's great, because there's nothing like your own staff telling you you're doing a terrible job to make people sit up and listen. Um, I think um, 
you know, I was always had a lot of BST sort of going on, but of course we became a listed company several years ago. So now it's quite a formalized process. We've got an ESG group. We had to have a head of ESG. I won't go into all the detail. If you're fascinated, there is of course a, a very comprehensive PDF in the investor part of our website you can, you, you can refer to. I knew you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, especially ESG is not my thing at all. I mean, we have a very skilled group of people who manage it for us. The one thing in Moldova, I just um, it's worth highlighting is that if you walk into most software engineering centers, in London, in Paris, in Germany, in New York, you'll be struck by something very, very quickly. What is it? It's all white men. In Moldova, actually, it's not like that at all. And it's because if you go to the universities, if you go to British universities, you immediately see the problem. It's uh, lots and lots of men and a small number of determined women who will be outstanding superstars, you can tell, because they will battle through it. You go to Moldovan universities and it's half and half. And this is reflected in our workforce, and we're very proud of it. It's not just in Moldova, but it's particularly strong in Moldova. We have very senior women, we have senior technical women, we have women um, um, you know, running centres, we have women setting policy, we have women in, in customer-facing delivery manager jobs. So it, it's only one aspect of diversity, but it is a very important first step. Uh, and that's something we're, I think we're particularly proud of and um, strong about in Moldova. Only by Ed, actually. It you know, the country is run by two women, and I think, uh, you know, that also deserves some, some, some appreciation. So the president is a woman, the prime minister is a woman, yeah. you know, and I think they're doing a fantastic job. I mean, they, they've been too modest, maybe to brag about themselves, but uh, I think for the first time in 30 years, we have two women from a fiercely pro-European party. That the integrity of these women, I think it's, nobody can, can doubt it. Very well educated, both Harvard educated, both high, high integrity, you know, and I think for the frontier investors in, uh, in this room, I think you, you probably know that the success of your investments in frontier markets, emerging markets, is largely about the strength of institutions and the strength of the, of the policies. Uh, and I think with uh, two, these two women in charge and a lot of uh, men uh, supporting them. <laughs> <laughs> Which and, is how it should be. I'm loving yeah, this. Uh, and a lot of men supporting them. I think they'll be doing a terrific yeah. job. As the father of an ambitious 16-year-old girl, I was heartened by your comment that the first three speakers were women. I immediately uh, whatsapped yeah. her a photograph. She, she yeah. was thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a co-chair of our Women Inspired Network in the UK. So what, what, what you're saying is, is really close to my heart. So, um, and when we were brainstorming about this event, I think the biggest driver behind that was to showcase the female leadership of, of Moldova, which is, I think, absolutely remarkable and outstanding. So, uh, and I think we're achieving this goal today. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to move on to the, uh, to your views on the future outlook for, um, for Moldova. So some, some of the highlights and growth opportunities, for example, the, during the previous panel, we heard about the, the mortgage, the level of mortgage uh, penetration and all of that. So maybe Jorgi, I'll invite you to expand on that. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll see if Owen and, and Basil also have some interest. Yes. Um... I think uh, there was um, the in, even if, if we start in Moldova. So I think we have two two important points to mention. One is the GDP growth itself, and then I think we can obviously always debate whether it is ten percent, five percent, or uh, or more. But it's clearly impressive uh, GDP growth, uh, given where we stand and given the integration with the West and uh, with EU and. Uh, potential convergence of the living standard. So that's one. The second one is um, is clearly the penetration, which we tried to mention. And uh, in uh, banking, uh, again, as measured as a loan to GDP, mortgage loan to GDP, or any other type of loan to GDP, it's very low. It's 22%. I mean, for comparison, I'm coming from Georgia. Loan to GDP in Georgia is about 70%. And Georgia is not... Uh, very different country from the immediate past perspective or uh, aspirations perspective or even number of population or uh, GDP per capita perspective. So they are qu uh, quite uh, quite close. Uh, mortgage loan to GDP, 4%. I mean, this uh, literally uh, gives you a good, uh, good growth opportunity. But I guess the bigger growth, and that uh, covers all the industries, uh, comes from potential to approach and um, and sell your products and services firstly to Moldovans who live uh, outside uh, Moldova in European Union and then uh, then uh, then the others after 
after the integration happens. And again, 600 to 700,000 Moldovans have a European Union passport. Clearly, we can approach them, we can offer digital products and services. The word digital is here is very important because clearly nobody from banking is going to go and invest in the heavy assets. It's more a satellite uh, digital uh, digital offering and then extend uh, from uh, that and the language sorry if you consider the language uh, uh, Romanian language in Moldova and uh, that gives us uh, uh, quite an advantage to offer these products and services uh, in uh, in in Romania so when we think about the growth this is the macro penetration story and plus the opportunities to to grow um, uh, in starting from Romania. Um, Vasil, um, you mentioned about um, the export and the diversifying away from Russia, thanks to you know some of the uh, structural obstacles, but actually this being a uh, blessing in disguise. So what, what is your biggest market for, um, uh, for exports? And then maybe just talk a little bit more about uh, Romania and how, you, and, and how you approach that market as well. Yeah, thank you for this question. I think it's important. Again, if we, if we're painting this, say, caricaturistic uh, uh, profile of investors, you know, kind of like pragmatic, cynical guys, like looking at these charts and trying to figure out where to allocate the capital, you know, then they probably look at Moldova and see like three million population. Like, why why bother? You know, like uh, uh, the market is too, too small. And in that sense, I think it's very important to to realize that. Uh, that the most Moldovan companies consider Romania as an extension of the domestic market. And then suddenly it's not a 3 million people market, it's like a 23 million people market. And I think this is becoming the norm. I'll give you just a few examples. So for Porcari, actually, we consider Romania to be our domestic market. You know, it's in that sense, it's by far the, the largest export market. You know, about 55% of our sales are in, are in Romania. And we feel in Romania as much as home as, as we see, uh, feel in Moldova. I'll give another example. We've been an investor in a company called Glass Container Company, acquired by Vetropac, uh, the Swiss listed strategic. And Vetropac acquired, acquired this company as a, a, a platform for a Romania based, uh, say, uh, game. So again, they, they 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 made the investment not not that much for the local domestic market, but as a platform for for playing in Romanian market. Again, my uh, with, with, with Georgi, I think. Uh, first of all, I have to say, like Georgi is just like a superstar CEO, or like superstar, not in the sense that he's like in closer <laughs> journals, but he's doing such a fabulous uh, job. You know, he's joined us for only what like uh, eight eight months, but already he's, he's made so much. And again, Georgi has very good experience with taking, say. Uh, franchises from a smaller country like Georgia in his case, and you know he led the expansion to Uzbekistan for for TBC. And I think, he, of course, he is he's a very credible person in terms of say taking the Maye franchise and trying to play on larger markets with a differentiating uh, proposition focused initially on uh, on Moldovan uh, migrants. You know, starting with uh, with Romania. So in that sense, I think this uh, you know it it really redefines the. It redefines the the perception of Moldova as a market because again, it's it's suddenly so you know it's not a three million but it's a twenty three million addressable opportunity and I think that that is just a much more exciting value proposition towards investors. Yes, and uh, you mentioned Uzbekistan. That's a, a huge, you know, fast growing frontier market, right? So that's uh, that's a really interesting, a really interesting. Um, I think market to be expanding in. So we'll see, we'll see. Maybe we'll see Maid there as well. Uh, if you're not already there. Uh, we, uh, I think our target will be Romania, Romania. approaching, <laughs> <laughs> approaching uh, yeah. Moldovans, first of all. <laughs> but from my past experience, uh, I think uh, uh, incumbent largest player developing the digital ecosystems in their home country and exporting those ecosystems um, across border does really work especially in our case we will have the advantage of uh, the language and people culture will being uh, very close so i think we will have lots of advantage of uh, exporting those um, services but again it will be digital it won't be asset heavy or yeah. with large yeah. investments yeah I, I like it if i may build on that and again I, i'm just trying to throw some numbers uh, there to to get the people excited here but i think this uh, ecosystem play i think uh, you, you've seen it mm -hmm. with one of your maybe most successful yeah. issuers in in uh, in monocopy congratulations for that by the way you know but but caspi based on my calculations represents 
you know, the market cap represents circa 14% of the GDP of Kazakhstan. Like if you're taking those, if you're doing those ratios, and again, I, it's a big if because we still have lots to go to build this ecosystem at Mayib, what Georgi is working hard on now, but like 14% of Moldovan GDP, you know, that, that gets you to like uh, comfortably above 1.5 billion potential market cap uh, territory, even with a small, smaller GDP we have now, which is expanding itself very fast. So I think for a bank that has, uh, that has a book value of uh, just north of 300 million now, and probably by the time we, we IPO, it's going to be a 400 million. It's still like, if you're doing your math, okay, you know, I enter at roughly one time book, you know, and then, but then it's like a 1.5 billion top uh, opportunity, then maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a great investment, especially if the bank delivers 20% ROE as uh, my uh, my is doing. And uh, Mikhail Lampadze, he actually joined one of our prior conferences uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he's a chief ecosystem officer, and he actually said what he does to develop the ecosystem um, uh, at Caspi KZ. And of course, uh, today, 27 billion market cap is kind of a representative of what of the value of uh, of digitalizing and you know bringing bringing the the digital assets you know and expanding the ecosystem beyond beyond the home market market as well. Yeah, the Georgians clearly have a thing with the yeah. ecosystem. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I want maybe you can comment uh, um, on um, this dynamic of Moldova and, and Romania and how do you view uh, this Romanian market from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're a major software engineering employer in both countries. We do lots of delivery from both. I will give one tip to people who first start traveling to the region. Don't treat Moldova as a province of Romania. Politically, that goes down very, very badly. As you can kind of understand, being, if you've really been in the UK long, you can imagine that referring to Wales as a province of, promise, um, <laughs> province of England does not go down very well. Uh, similar kind of things, but with a sovereign nation. So I have seen quite a number of people from Western Europe make that mistake. It can be a bit confusing because Eastern Romania is often referred to as Moldavia. So it can be confusing, but um, just as you cross the border, change your mindset. Um, um, I find, I mean, actually the way I normally travel to Kishinev, actually I go in via Yash in Eastern Romania, because that's one of our delivery cities, a beautiful city in Eastern Romania. I drive across the country, I go in uh, across the land border, I drive across uh, to, to Kishinev. It's a very straightforward process. The two countries are very cooperative. Um, we very, very regularly staff projects across the two countries. We are in quite a few countries. We're very sensitive to the fact that sometimes it's easier to staff projects with people from some countries rather than other countries. But certainly um, all of my observation of now seven years is that Romania and Moldova are best friends. They get along very well. The people have got s similar mindsets. Of course, there's a, there's a shared language for many Moldovans and Romanians of Romanian. Um, although it's also important to just bear in mind that Moldovans also have Russian language skills, which can be terrifically valuable, has been for us on a number of occasions. But yes, we find it's a very frictionless process to, to get teams working across the two sites, uh, or the, the many sites across the two countries. So, um, I think you mentioned that Romania is almost like a domestic market for Moldova at the moment. Are there any customs, tax and legal uh, obstacles to that? No, uh, and uh, since 2013, Moldova, uh, Moldova signed actually uh, the EU association agreement with the European Union and Romania being a member, of course, we have this uh, privileged uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement and uh, beyond that. So, so uh, uh, speaking for ourselves, let's say two, two companies exporting uh, physical goods, Purkari and glass container. Um, the, the the process is actually very smooth, so that's why I, I say like we see it as an extension of our domestic market. Uh, and my understanding is that in say uh, uh, knowledge economy focused companies like in Davos, I think uh, uh, Owen's example is also very 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 illustrative. And uh, I, I've heard the word the convergence today. So um, you know many many believe that uh, Moldova you know is where Romania was in pre accession. So Romania joined the EU in two thousand and seven. You know, and uh, like uh, again, some of the people who kind of have the benefit of uh, of longer term time horizon and have seen have seen the the journey of Romania, like uh, many of my uh, Romanian friends actually tell me that it feels it feel now Moldova feels like like Romania uh, pre accession. So, which of course makes us very very excited about the the, the potential. Right. So, I'd like to invite any questions from uh, from the audience. Okay. Okay. Georgi, uh, can you shed a bit more light on uh, your strategic considerations to launch an IPO versus the bond? First one and second, if somebody asks you, 
do not see this IPO as a way to escape potential challenges of the former shareholder who was stripped off of his shares, Mr. Platon? So um, we have, um, and thanks for the questions. So we do have the uh, very high liquidity, as you may I think mentioned, and the system has very high liquidity. And uh, clearly with this high liquidity, the launching any uh, Euro bonds in the immediate future is not, um, is not expected. I think uh, IPO is uh, something that we are working uh, on uh, very closely. Um, and uh, when we are ready, we will launch. But as you understand, this is the reason why um, uh, I am here and we continue engagement. On the other case, it's, uh, there is a case opened uh, on the, by the prosecution. I don't think I can comment uh, on it, but uh, I'm sure from the perspective of uh, IPO and the brand strategy and positioning, uh, it will be success story, not only for the bank, uh, but for the business climate because when from the small country, uh, the largest bank does uh, an IPO on a uh, recognized, a very strong international platform. This bank then starts acting as the gateway to bring new investors to position the country well uh, to the international investors. So this will be a big story for the bank and for the country. Mm -hmm. John? If I could ask, um... So there was two really interesting surprises for me. One was the, uh, the biggest fine vineyard acreage since uh, far from Australia or similar size. And, and the second thing was about the 8,000 people in Moldova that the, you're employing on the tech side. Yeah, we're not really I actually I checked with my head of investor relations, and we are not meant to comment on the size of individual centers. But if I just say you can, if you, especially if you're a financial analyst, you can work out roughly the size of our centers. Moldova is one of our largest centers. Okay. Does it, has it created more competition in that some of your former employees left? Is there now a thriving kind of competitive digital scene, scene yes. that, that you would identify? Very much so. You can see it as a positive or a negative. If you're a software engineer in Kishinev, it's very much a positive. Um, the world has, uh, we had Kishinev, not entirely to, to ourselves, but we were the biggest employer by a long way for a very long time. And now, just as happened in Romania, we were pioneers in Romania too. Um, now, the world has finally woken up to the fact that those Moldovan software engineers that they met in London came from a city called Kishno. They might have friends. So yes, I mean, undoubtedly, particularly in certain skills areas. And for example, you mentioned renewables. I mean, you could certainly see the potential that the same thing could ripple into other industries. But right now, the software industry, yes, we are seeing salary inflation, no doubt about it. But that's a very positive thing. If you're a software engineer, we are happy to pay people market rates. We always have. There was a question over there. And then, and then the gentleman over there. So we'll start with you. Um, so, Yogi, could you provide any color on the IPO, for example, to know what percentage state you're planning to list, where it will be listed, stuff like that? Sure. I, I mean, it's very early, early days, and clearly we need to take the, the appropriate decision by, by the shareholders. But I think what we would be expecting would be between 30 and 50 percent. Uh, um, and uh, it would be maybe one third uh, primary to third secondary, but again, very very initial uh, initial numbers. We have not taken the specific decisions uh, so far yet. Maybe at the beginning of next year we will be more precise. Yes. So I also have a question for Georgi. You mentioned a couple of times that Maib is the biggest bank in Moldova, but at least two of your competitors have very large international banks behind them. And I'm just wondering from point of view of your position as the biggest bank, but competing against banks that have bigger banks behind them, what's your advantages and disadvantages? Oh, so yes, uh, clearly. So I think, uh, I mean, in terms of numbers, uh, maybe I'll say again, it, we are 35% of the, uh, the loan market share, and then the next one is 19, then we come 17. And, and uh, then 11, but clearly there are banks that have very strong groups and they are part of the international groups. But we do have our own advantages, especially the fact that we take decisions on the ground uh, faster. The fact that because we are bigger, we can uh, 
uh, we can invest a local, we have bigger scale locally invest more. I think how we are differentiating uh, ourselves is clearly you know, focusing on the customer experience, on digital presence, and in both of them, we do have specific strengths. Our task now is to ensure that we build on the current strengths and then we build uh, uh, the new strategy that I, I mentioned or refresh strategy that I mentioned. And if I may add, as now as a board, board member of uh, Mayib, uh, I think uh, uh, if you're looking at the, again, continuing this discussion about Moldova kind of following the footsteps of Romania to some extent, you, you've seen what happened in Romania. So the local independent bank, Bank of Transylvania, I think they, they, they gave around for the money to, to all the internationals on the market. So if you're looking like where Erste Bank was in, in the 2000s and uh, has been overtaken by a local champion and, you know, and they're competing against like the who is who of the global strategic, you know, I think Erste is there, Stationer is there, and Tessa San Paolo is there, like all the big guys are there and still like they, 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 the um, Banca de Sylvania local champion uh, won by, uh, I think, by, by, by a big margin. And I think some of that is going to repeat in Moldova. And I think there's qualities in my Ip staying independent, staying hungry, not being part of some global kind of bureaucracy, kind of some one of these like a bit of boring banks. So I think there's uh, there's also uh, qualities in that. <laughs> yeah. So by, by the structure that you've seen uh, in many, many markets and uh, I'm sure you know this, but then uh, let's say in Georgia, two the, the two biggest banks, uh, they are uh, Georgian. Um, by the way, number two bank it's Moldovan bank as well. So I think you still need in small countries local uh, decision making power, local relationship, and if you do it right, then you have lots of strengths to succeed locally. We have a question from the lady here. My question is for Mr. Tupac. So, um, when will I be able to go on the local trial for the last two school? Take a Rosetta Pro card with a very much bit of a useful piece as if you go to Australia. Okay. So, <laughs> you, you can. Can I ask you the same question? Okay. <laughs> Uh, look, th thank you for the question, and uh, 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 I have a temptation to joke to joke about it, but I'll give you actually a very practical answer. So, uh, you you just uh, type in, uh, you can just type in Purkar, you know, in a in a, in a browser, and you can buy it from Amazon. You can buy it from TransylvaniaWines.co.uk. You can buy it from Eightwines.com and uh, from many online retailers. I think, as again speaking of the digitalization trend. I think uh, many of the challenging uh, companies, challenger companies like ours, you know, we are we're leapfrogging the traditional retail and uh, making a, a, a bet on uh, online distribution simply because it's less crowded. You know, it, it it's more open to to uh, wines from new countries like ours, and I think this is the right strategy to go. I think you have to pick your battles. I'm not going to compete against the Tesco private label and so on, and there's no margin there. So I think we're going the leapfrogging uh, route. At the same time, at the same time, you know, because we, you know, uh, we do want to be in these sort of prestige locations. We are available in a number of prestige locations. For example, the Walkie Talkie building, I know, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm not, not sure what the name is, but you know, the Walkie Talkie okay. building. Just, just, that's the know, name, I think. Just, I don't know uh, any other name. <laughs> maybe half a mile from here, you know, they have this super fancy to a, a rooftop restaurant. And if you open the menu there, you have like a good selection of Bukhari wines. They're going to be expensive, but uh, I think given the fact you're at this event, I think you can afford it. <laughs> I'm loving it. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, if I may return to Yogi, um, there was a question asked that seems to contrast the IPO with the idea of issuing euro bonds. Are you ruling out issuing euro bonds in the near future? No, I mean in the in the in the short term, let's say six months. Let's define this. I think we have more than enough liquidity. You would never exclude the possibility of issuing euro bonds, but I think given the fact that we have very strong liquidity, it would not just make sense for us to spend money and time for issuing euro bonds. But if you take the longer term picture, these things tend to change very frequently, right? So you think that you have very high liquidity and then one day you do the focus and you don't, and uh, then yes, then you start uh, issuing, uh, issuing. Uh, you start exploring what you can do. By the way, we last week we did uh, sign the agreement with EFSA uh, related to the subordinated loan, which uh, is uh, somehow funding uh, part as well. 
and uh, this is the uh, subordinated loan per current uh, uh, regulator standard, uh, with, which is very close to uh, Basel III, which clearly uh, with the with the all the strict measures of Basel III, and then this is um, uh, this is also supports our funding, but also supports our capital optimization. And I'm happy to say that this is um, uh, first time that I'm hearing on the market to. And it's a local uh, and, yeah, exactly, it's a local currency, which is even even more important. Okay. Thank you. I may another one that uh, Georgi he mentioned the uh, loan to deposit ratio, I think, of forty eight percent. Is that a sign of uh, limited opportunities on the market, or you are extra? Why is it so low? So yeah, so the, the, the good 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 question. So I think. I mentioned uh, liquidity ratio 48%, which is very high, and we have lots of cash. When we deploy this cash in the loan, that will help our margins and our growth, uh, and will have will simplify our growth story. But the loan to deposit that you mentioned, it's very good to highlight. The country's penetration in loans is 22%. Uh, against GDP and penetration uh, in deposits, it's higher. It's 44% against GDP. So loan to deposit is about 60%. This is the very strong, very good place. Anyone you take in the region, whatever is the criteria to define region or peer banks, peer yeah. countries, sorry, you would have. Uh, this is the this is very comfortable uh, paced, uh, place to be. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering again to Georgi if I could ask regarding the uh, so um, from the bank's perspective, we've heard um, how you plan to uh, uh, grow your portfolio. But are there other constraints uh, in the country, in particular with mortgages, uh, in terms of the um, suitable housing stock, sufficient housing stock, in fact, to, to lend against, and uh, on the corporate side, in terms of collateral by firms to provide against the assets? So, what is your take on this? Yeah, so this is a great question. I think uh, in the in terms of the housing, we are seeing the uh, quite good developments and constructions in the country. Maybe we should see more over time, and with the increase of uh, of um, our mortgages and the increase of the integration that we are talking this uh, morning, this will increase, and uh, we see the our customers already exploring this but good news is that we do try we try to implement the framework where to see that are we in the bubble or do we see the rapid price increases and taking uh, this uh, framework which is on our site by the way under the our investor presentation we see that it's neutral so even though there is a slight pickup in the pricing and the rents uh, the rest of the criteria is very neutral so it's very comfortable from the risk and growth perspective uh, to be um, in terms of the collateral this is a very good question as well uh, in especially for SME uh, yes there is uh, sometimes a lack of collateral as you would have in any other country um, there are special programs uh, by the government uh, including EBRD and uh, IMF to some, somehow support through the funds the SME customers for uh, who do not have collateral we we, we, we may see further uh, further programs yes they will need some some support uh, but this is the case in any any other other country for corporate I, I I wouldn't say that there is anything very specific to to flock just one question for me from this gentleman uh were you just it wasn't you didn't raise your hand no no sorry Okay. okay. I have a question for Evan. Uh, in terms of, so we're hearing about labor shortages everywhere. And I'm wondering, and as an, an employer, and a relatively large one here in Moldova, and maybe you guys can comment on it as well. And what is, what is that environment right now with so many people being able to leave to work in EU? How is it, how difficult is it to find qualified people in Moldova right now? Um, I have to say that finding the kind of software engineer we're after who's skilled, good with people, well-educated, um, easy fits into our culture. I mean, that's difficult everywhere. That's difficult hiring in Bogota, Colombia. It's difficult hiring in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's difficult hiring in uh, uh, 
Berlin, it's difficult hiring in Bucharest, and it's difficult hiring in Kishinev. But actually, if you look at the growth we've managed to have in Kishinev and continue to have in Kishinev, it's perfectly achievable. It's about creating the right employer environment. There's two main things for why we believe, or people tell us why they continue to work for Indava. One is the fact that we are very, um, we're very long-term thinkers in terms of people's careers. Quite a lot of our competitors are quite transactional. They need them for a project. If there's another project at the end, that's great. They'll continue to employ them, but there's no guarantees. We hire people hoping they'll retire out of Indava. Um, we're not quite an old enough company that that's happened very often. We've just had a few, but um, that's our view. We're, we're, they're with us for careers and we always, we continue investing in them. We're moving them between projects deliberately so they're getting better experience. The second thing, the reason they come to us is the quality of projects and the scale of projects they can work on, which are Western European, North American, leading edge, large projects. Whereas a lot of the work that is placed in Moldova, especially in the smaller firms, is actually relatively small, relatively you know, mundane projects. And they can get much more interesting work, much more stretching and challenging work by working for Indava. So that's how we, uh, as well as all the hygiene factors of great office space, good environment, paying people well, making sure that people have good, good social events, making sure that um, they make sure their hardware is up to date. You know, there's a lot of stuff you have to do. The two things that seem to make, make the real difference of those. Maybe I can also, from our perspective, um, uh, it's, it is clearly, yes, it is clearly difficult, but I think the advantage we have uh, also is that we have access to the other markets around and uh, because uh, of the location, I think we have uh, a few very good specialists from Ukraine who have joined uh, us and who are joining us. We are working closely with few Romanian um, companies who also support us and um, have um, also are searching in Belarus. So the, 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 on the one hand, the yes, on uh, this location is a disadvantage for the perspective that people living uh, easily. But on the other hand, you also have access to the to the ad, other markets. That's how um, we are from the banking trying to uh, to solve this uh, to solve this. Yeah, on my side, I'll add, I don't sugarcoat it. I think it's a challenge. And um, the, I think uh, we count on the fact that also, say, the government uh, and the policymakers are going to be receptive to this challenge. Uh, it could, uh, I, one, say, uh, concern I have, uh, which is that the good news may, may further, uh, the good news may further aggravate the challenges. And the good news is that uh, many, many uh, foreign powers and institutions want Moldova to succeed. We already see the, the money starting to trickling in. We expect much more money to come. If you look at the example of Armenia, I think after Pashinyan's victory, two months after the victory, you know, EU announced a package of $3 billion for Armenia on a five-year uh, time horizon. So $3 billion, that's 25% of, uh, of uh, Armenia GDP. So my view is that Moldova, again, without making any ranking, I think Moldova is at least as e equally important to to you as um, as Armenia, so we expect those structural funds to come. Now the question is, when this flood of money comes, of course, at some point the the labor shortages will uh, will aggravate. You know, because you'll need people to go build infrastructure, you will need people to go build you know schools and water pipes and so on. And I think, in part, the solution is going to be tackled by our respected uh, uh, national bank regulators, who've been very consistently you know pursuing the inflation targeting mandate. But at some point, you know, probably raising the rates too much will will not address uh, some of the sources of inflation, which is going to be on the labor supply side. And there, in my humble view, uh, uh, the view the solution is further liberalizing the labor market. You know, removing removing you know uh, ideas out of the box ideas as removing uh, you know uh, residence permit requirements for for foreigners. You know, for example, like like in the neighboring areas of Ukraine or even, even Romania, removing like working permits for foreigners and so on. I think, and I think this, who knows, like politically this may, may prove maybe not very popular, but in terms of say sound policy that may address the, the labor shortages, I think we'll need it. And frankly, if we think of ourselves as a sort of like little Singapore of the Eastern Europe that wants to trade both with West and East, at some point you'll have to liberalize those things. And really I think labor is one of the big concerns I have. Don't to sound too dramatic. I think it's a concern everywhere, but you know, but we 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 need uh, we need to also I think take some some progressive labor reforms to to address. By the way, we have the 
job fair today in the evening. That's why. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <So> we're doing <laughs> we our part. We're doing our part. <laughs> yeah, yes, we invited Moldovans who work here and uh, just want to persuade them that they should uh, should return to the country. And then this diaspora is um, is a very good uh, advantage, though, but because if you do the what we are trying to do from the bank's perspective, I'm sure that we will be interested company uh, to be joined. I'm sure the same goes to any other company, the same goes to the to the government. So there's uh, clearly opportunity there. Okay, any, any more questions? I don't think we have any more questions. So with that, I'd like to thank our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for your insight and I'd like to bring this event to a close. Thank you very much. So I won't be doing any closing remarks, so uh, very happy to. Thank you very much. Thank you.